Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with Trainer Road and Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Hello, everybody. Our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everyone. And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. Chad never sounds enthused. <laughs> I'm here by force. <laughs> just need to warm up. Chad enthused. <laughs> it's it. Chad just needs some. T- Once Chad hits his stride, it's it's all on. Um, this is where you can submit the. This is where you get answers. When you're to older. The it takes longer to warm up, Nate. That's I was going to say it's two, two drinks is usually Chad's stride. <laughs> <laughs> we never know what's in the coffee cup. It's early, but um, so. Uh, <laughs> This is where you can submit questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast and get them answered every week. We get a ton of questions and we're super grateful for all of you uh, sending them in. Even your silly rapid fire ones, keep sending those ones in. Uh, we're going to talk about spirit Disney characters today in the rapid fire section. So I'm sure we're definitely not burying the lead. That's the lead of the whole podcast. So, um, but Amber, this is your last podcast with us for a while, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm going on t- tomorrow's my last day at work and then I'm going on maternity leave. It's happening. <laughs> Amber's going to, I know. <laughs> so when, when you is your due date, Amber? Yeah. yeah. August 22nd. So it's coming up. And for some reason, I just thought, oh, well, I'll just keep working until either I go into labor or the due date comes, whichever comes first. Um, but interestingly and amazingly, the third trimester is, is a little bit more challenging than I thought <laughs> it might be. So that was a, that was naive on my part, but it's, um, it's been awesome because even, kind of being able to go with the flow and play it by ear a little bit and and make these decisions more on the fly because this is not by any stretch a a certain timeline right so um it's been amazing to have that flexibility and have been gosh so supported by everyone here at trainer road um all through my pregnancy and and even now um yeah it's definitely it's definitely the right time to step back a little bit and and kind of get ready uh, as much as you can. <laughs> Is this, common. what's, what's it been like? Uh, so you gave us, I think a first trimester update and then it was mid second mm-hmm. trimester. Has, yeah. have you been training? Have you like seen, like, have you seen nutrition stuff change, sleep change, anything like that? Just uh, people want to know what it's been like for you so they can have an N equals one, but nonetheless an important one. Yeah. Um, the big thing for me has been fatigue and it's really different for everybody. So I, I did actually step back on the training front because really this is a, this is very much a process of kind of letting go and allowing <laughs> and letting my body do its thing. Cause I sure don't know how to make a whole human being from scratch, but apparently this body does. And so I'm just kind of like, okay, body, <laughs> you tell me what you need. Um, so I've, I've dialed back on the training and it's just been, it's been good. I'm training to the degree that it feels really good to move, but not so much that it's, it's really taxing and affecting me because my baseline energy levels are quite a bit lower than usual, just because I'm busy making a human being, which is really wild to think about. Um, and then it sleep, it's it, the, the way that they break things up into trimesters is really pretty, uh, f- for good reason. Like second trimester was very, uh, I felt like my energy levels bounced back. Um, and now that I've entered the third, third trimester, energy levels have gone down again and sleep has become, uh, challenging (laughs) and everybody's telling me this is when you're supposed to be banking the sleep. And it's a little bit disconcerting because, um, it's getting harder and harder to sleep. I mean, just rolling over in bed is a, is a major production at this point. (laughs) Amber, this lack of sleep is about four to five years of this. (laughs) <laughs> it's true it's true it doesn't, what will happen is you will uh about three months in your kid will sleep through the night you'll think that they died and you'll run in, <laughs> but then stuff will have like you'll get like three nights in a row and you're like i we made it and you'll tell everyone we made it we're through the clear and then they'll start teething <laughs> and then they will be teethed or sick or uh just annoying for the rest of until they're like probably maybe three three ish somewhere around there but there'll be a lot of I don't know, crazy stuff. My son used to wake up in the middle of the night and he'd be around the house. We'd go to get something in the middle of the night and he'd be standing in a corner like a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff to look forward to, Amber. That's Honestly, amazing. this is so, this is part of what's been so fun is that like, uh, well, a few of our colleagues have had kids recently as well. So it's been so wonderful to see 
the joy that they're experiencing, but also hear some of these, <laughs> the warnings <laughs> and the tips and the, the advice. And it's, it's great. It's just been incredibly supportive. So yeah. Um, a whole adventure ahead. That is for I, sure. One more pro tip. Uh, have you taken a child CPR class yet? Yes, we actually just, um, actually just a couple days ago worked with our doula. She showed us how, and then we're going to get certified. Mm. So, yep. My, yep. uh, story for anyone else might help when my daughter was four days old, I picked up like her bottom a bit to change her diaper and that caused like throw up to go. And she was choking on her throw up and she actually turned purple. Like, oh, oh I had to flip her over, do the thing you like, you put them in their arm, you flip them over upside down and slap them on the back. And she was fine after that. But that was the, that was very yeah. bad. And then my daughter, again, when she was like five choked on a piece of like imitation crab, it's kind of like hot dog oh. shape. And, uh, my ex-wife had to I think he, she slapped her on the back or something. He didn't do a full Heimlich, but anyways, it's very important yeah. for parent to do that. Choking's like, I'm so paranoid about choking. Yeah. yeah Cause I feel helpless. Reason. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can't like, yeah, it's yeah. It's, but if you know the things, stuff. it's not that bad. I mean, it is bad, yes. but you can help. Yeah. Right. right. It's so That's incredible. Right. Um, uh, Amber, I, I really appreciate you sharing how you backed off on the training. Cause I feel like particularly in endurance sport, you know, circles were like this woman ran Boston and she did it like one day after having a baby or something. We see those like news headlines and some people are like, I, I was running marathons every day until I had my child, you know, and like we hear those stories. And I think that there's like an assumption like, okay, well, why didn't I do that? Man, right. I must've really been lazy, <laughs> like, or what's wrong with me. And that's, it's just like, it's so different for everybody. For some people right. that totally works for other people. It totally doesn't. So I'm grateful for you sharing your experience on that. Like, yeah, and I also, thanks. one thing that, uh, so every part of me wants to say, Amber, you're going to be an amazing mom because, uh, <laughs> I, I do feel that way, but at the same time I noticed, and this is also with my wife, like some pressure with that. Some, um, uh, my wife, since she was like a little kid, she was called the baby whisperer. Like everyone called her that because she just had this connection with children. So she felt like, cause her whole entire life, she'd heard, you're going to be a great mom just repeated count like countless times. And the fact is all every new mom sucks. Like you <laughs> yeah. all suck at being a parent when you have a child because no, you've never you done no it before. Idea what you're Not doing. suck. I think it's the, uh, in my experience, you hold yourself up to a standard that is not yes. attainable. And then you realize that that standard that you see like Instagram and stuff and, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's stuff like is not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Like the, but the point is nobody is good at it. And you're going to come to the real, everyone comes to the realization at some point, like this is, why isn't this working? This is so hard. And I feel like there's like this pressure that we put on ourselves, especially when we hear from everybody, you're going to be a great parent. <laughs> right. And then you're like, oh, but I'm not a great parent. And it's like, <laughs> it's a hard moment, but no. I feel like, uh, I, I don't know that added a lot of stress. I, uh, particularly for my wife. Cause she kind of felt like I'm supposed to be good at this. Like, why isn't everything just working? It's mm -hmm. such a crazy, unpredictable and constantly like you think you're, you think like Nate said, you think you've got it locked down and then like it throws, <laughs> throws you a curveball all the no. time. And I'm sure that will continue for the rest of life, <laughs> so, but oh, it's Amber, just the best. It's so incredible. You, I'm taking a different approach from John. You were awesome <laughs> at it. It's just a steep climb and it's just yeah. hard. Yeah. Hey, like you can, you can have a six watt per kilo. It's just really steep and it's going to take a long time <laughs> and it's hard. You might feel mm -hmm. like you suck at it, but you're actually really good. It's just natural. And everyone was like, when your kid's born, like you feel differently and yeah. It's okay to not they know what you're doing and it's okay to, to, to like guess and make helpless. mistakes and feel helpless. Yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. are you, you know, crying? I, I so appreciate you guys saying that. And it's been really cool. Cause a lot of our colleagues here at trainer road have been so honest and vulnerable about their experiences as new parents that it does make me feel so much better that, you know, even, even just when we're talking about cycling stuff and, and we talk about the challenges that we face and the things that we struggle with, hearing other people echo those things is so comforting because you feel like, okay, I'm not alone and mm -hmm. everybody else doesn't have it figured out. And I, I feel really grateful to be able to go into this with that perspective of knowing that, hey, you know, other people are doing this and other people don't know what they're doing <laughs> and <laughs> they're okay. Like they're okay. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really awesome. So thanks. You Remember guys. 
remember Chad and Nate when uh, uh, when I was when we were having our son, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm, all I'm gonna do is split my big workouts into two. Like, what did I just, say? <laughs> you're like, "That ain't gonna work." <laughs> you were right, <laughs> but I was just like, "It'll be so easy. I'll just I had a two hour workout. I'll just do it in one hour, then one hour. Easy." You said you three know? times a day. You're gonna wake up, do 45 minutes. Do an I hour think that lunch, may have lasted for three days <laughs> if I was lucky. <laughs> I want to see if Amber uh, picks up running. Because of all the, even cycling indoors with the oh, kid, you mm -hmm. can do a pack and play, but uh, running is a lot, they, they're a lot quieter and there's like the motion or mm. you can do a fast walk, but a lot of people pick up running and it's nice to get out of the house. Uh, you can give your partner to space because you go away. Maybe there's like a one. safe water bassinet that you can like put your baby in. Then you can just tow, tow the baby on your swim lap. <laughs> and your kick turns. <laughs> Hold on, baby. <laughs> it's, it's a, a baby submarine. <laughs> I like it every time flip around. Yeah. Uh, funny. I love uh, this. Well, the whole podcast has triathlon plans for me already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Speaking of triathlon stuff, um, which uh, I, I am not even getting close to calling myself a triathlete here, but the pool is finished in our neighborhood. It's a whopping 15 meters. Uh, I said on Instagram that I was going to get great at kick turns. And I guess that that's not flip the right turns. word. It's flip turns. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My bad. It shows how much I know about swimming. I, I, oh, Chad, I, I thought you were just trolling him. <laughs> no, I've I, I I outed myself real bad, real quick there. Um, by saying that it was going to be kick turns, kick but um, apparently it's flip turns. Amber, I'm so bad. Like, like I thought I was bad at swimming. I am so bad. And I've already seen this on Instagram. Tons of triathletes are like, I'm better than you. And they're loving it. And they're like, I'm better than Jonathan at something. And so I'm happy you to. are absolutely welcome to uh, for them yeah. and myself. <laughs> yeah. Amber, I have this crazy problem where, um, well, first of all, I'm learning that swimming with your head, like down in the water is, is awesome and way easier. And I feel mm -hmm. like I can go faster. Like, uh, like really like down, you know, like looking down just at the bottom looking and straight then straight down instead of looking ahead. Yeah. And I can't tell, but I feel like my whole head is like submerged almost. Um, but mm -hmm. it might not be, I don't know. I don't really have that sort of perception going on, but the problem is, is anytime when I go to like, like roll my head to the side and get air, I just have this like little wake of water right there that just smashes into my face every time I'm breathing. So I just drink Talk your water. Chin. And so what so do you mean by like that? This. Nate? Your chin should be yeah. more down. So when you're going like this, it should be like turning to yeah. the, so your chin's kind of close to your face rather than you're probably looking forward and over when you're kind of trying to get air. Oh yeah. I right. bet you I actually am. create this little wake thing. You'll see on the Olympics where the, your face creates this wake and you breathe in that little like wake thing. I know this is a, we got like a super high level swimmer here and I'm answering this question, <laughs> but I, this, this is too, because I am bad. I am not a good swimmer. And Amber is a very good swimmer too. So sometimes you so can you've get had tips to, from bad people. Yes, you've exactly. You stumble Where, through stuff too, right, Nate? Amber stumbling when she was like four. <laughs> in many, many years. <laughs> like, you just breathe, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amber corrects me. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. I think uh, a big mistake that a lot of people make is not realizing that when you turn your head to the side to breathe, number one, you only want to turn your head and not your body. And number two, well, you don't, well, you don't want to turn your body too much. There's a some some fudge factor there but also you don't want to be looking straight out to the side or ahead you actually want to be looking behind you a little bit which does exactly what Nate's describing which uh -huh. is it tucks your chin a little bit and then when you're moving through the water with a little bit of velocity doesn't have to be super fast you actually do create a little wave that moves around your mouth um, but you can practice this even without the wave and just go to the edge of the pool put both hands on the edge of the pool and then do a little bit of a flutter kick so that you keep your body floating and then kind of do a, a fake arm pull on one side, still holding onto the side and then turn your head to the side and just experiment with positioning your chin and where you're looking when you turn your head to the side and feel if you're moving your whole body. Cause if you try to look up or forward, it pushes the back end of your body down. And if you think about it, your torso is the most buoyant part of your body. Cause that's where your lungs are. And the heaviest part of your body is from your waist down, which is why you want to kick. But when you lift the front end of your body up even more, it makes it even harder to keep that back end of your body up. And that pulls you down into the water, which makes it harder to keep your mouth above the water to get a breath, right? 
And this is my experience entirely, Ember. <laughs> it just gets worse <laughs> as I continue to swim. And then I feel like I'm standing straight up trying to move through the water. Right. It's just like terrible. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is something to work on even before you start doing laps, like get really, really comfortable with this. The other thing I would say is focus on getting really comfortable at exhaling. Cause when you exhale, you're breathing off carbon dioxide. And as you breathe off carbon dioxide, that's kind of the, the thing, the, the accumulation of carbon dioxide is what drives that feeling of panic that you need to breathe and you need to get air. And so if you can learn to, to exhale under the water, really, really in a really relaxed, relaxed manner, exhale enough carbon dioxide that actually blowing off the carbon dioxide helps you relax too. And then when you breathe in, it's not going to be a panicked breath. The other thing it does is if you breathe out all, if you complete your exhale before you turn your head, so you're not breathing out and in when you turn your head, that also helps. So getting your breath down is going to be super important because the more comfortable you are with breathing, the less you're going to be in fight or flight survival mode. And the more you're going to be able to focus on other aspects of your stroke technique. So it's worth just going to the side of the pool, figuring out head position, practicing exhaling under the water so that when you're turning your head, you're only inhaling. And then you can shift from the side of the pool to a kickboard and then do one arm stroke at a time to really practice that with a little bit more velocity. Um, and then transfer, you know, from the kickboard to like a full stroke and, and try that. So it's a, it's worth spending a lot of time on because it will accelerate your progress after that. I have no shame in asking the dumb questions. Uh, when you are, ex when you're exhaling under the water, I'm doing it with my nose. Cause I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just used to like anytime I'm swimming and I'm in the water, I'm usually like cliff jumping or something. It's like blowing out through my nose, right? Like the right. whole time are, when are you breathing out through your nose under the water or out your mouth too? Just a little nose. bit of both. Wow. A little okay. bit of both, but, but breathing out your nose is important because it does keep your sinuses clear, right? Cause you, you have that pressure. So you don't have water coming up into your sinuses and it can be more comfortable, but I would do a little bit of both because by doing both, you can breathe out more air, which is more carbon dioxide. And you're more likely to complete your exhale before you turn your head to inhale. So I would try a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Nate, do you have, do you have a swim? T Those are awesome tips, Amber. Now I feel like I have a list of things to do. Do you have Start something? Start recording yourself and put it on Instagram stories for us all <laughs> to enjoy. No, but I, I mean. keegan has been that... begging Sarah to send him videos because he wants to see me suck and he wants to make fun of me for it. So, yeah. No, but it's, it's, um, it is actually though, I say that jokingly, but it's also serious is early on, there'll be people like Amber and there are a few people on the internet will want to give you advice. Even if they, whatever they know, they will give oh, I'm you already about. getting it. <laughs> when I just said, Amber, I'm terrible. Please help. I had like books written by people that were like, yeah. here's what you need to do, you know? But there are a lot of people that will know, and there's going to be some things yeah. that people will be spotting. And if you constantly film yourself swimming and you're constantly working on one thing at a time, just one thing, because someone will write a book, you don't need a book. It's just like Amber said, you work on one thing, your, your head yeah. position when you're breathing, you do that for a few weeks, then you keep improving you will be so much better than just trying to nail laps and two swimming in a 15 meter pool pointless like <laughs> it's too many turns like it's a lot of die. turns yeah get a, get a tether it's like two yeah. strokes that's what i was looking at uh, tethers so then i can just swim in place there and then later on it's some other when i'm doing a triathlon most likely it's not going to involve kick turns all right Flip turns, flip turns, flip turns. Flip turns. <laughs> whatever <laughs> turns <laughs> those. Yes. Thank you, Chad. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, exactly. It's more important to focus on the stroke and stuff. Is there anything when you're using a tether that's like that totally decouples from the normal experience that you would have when you're swimming and I should watch out for that? Like, could I build bad habits in other words with that? Probably. I would wait, uh, I would wait on the tether and I think you can actually get a lot done in a 15 yard pool. Um, it's, it's not going to be great for your endurance, right? But mm -hmm. you're at the very beginning right now. So this is actually when you want to, you want to front load the technical work and it's completely fine. You can get really, really high quality technical work done. So doing lots of drills. Um, so starting with the breathing drills, you can, you know, the, the internet is full of really great instructional videos on, on different types of drills that you can do to, to work on specific things. But I wouldn't even think about any of that until your breathing feels really easy and natural. Because again, like if you, if you are not comfortable breathing, that's a really primal 
survival necessity, <laughs> right? Yes. Your brain is not going to let you get into the learning zone if you are not comfortable breathing and you don't feel like you have enough air. So I would spend like, if you need to spend weeks on that, um, getting comfortable with that before you start working on technique stuff. And with the technique stuff, you can really, you can do a lot in 50 meters. I had to get shoulder surgery in college. And when I was coming back through therapy, it was literally one day at a time. So one day I was allowed to do one lap of breaststroke. That was it. That was all I was allowed to do for the whole workout. And then the next day was two laps. And the next day it was three laps. And I was not a great breaststroker at that time, but I focused so intently on quality. And I really, I would come in and I would say, okay, I have one lap. How much can I get out of this one lap? So you're showing up at your pool and you're like, all right, <laughs> I got 15 yards. How much can I get out of this 15 yards and really focus on the quality right now. Um, and eventually you'll get to a point where you're like, okay, yeah, I really need to get to a longer pool, but, or maybe yeah. you need to get a tether. Um, but I would start with just start front loading with technique, heavy stuff first, because if you get the technique down, the endurance is going to come so easy for you, Jonathan, you already have a huge engine, but it's the technique. That's going to be your biggest challenge. Yeah. I was, I was breathing. Like I did a five minute VO two effort after like a minute and a half, <clears throat> like same breathing <laughs> that I would have on the bike, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it was so well, slow. Like, you know, part that's of, just part of that goes. isn't your effort. Part of that is, is your brain panicking, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and your adrenaline going and it's not necessary for the effort that you're putting out, but your brain thinks that you're in the life or death yes. situation, <laughs> which may be true. <laughs> Yeah. And it's only like three and a half feet deep too. And I'm very aware of that, but it doesn't matter your body when you're submerged in the right. water swimming like that. It just, yeah. Has those reactions. Yeah. I've done exactly. many so. triathlons and I was on swim team and like when I was, what I want to do with John, because I was, I used to suck at, well, I used to mountain biking. John helped me, but maybe went on some rides bigger than <laughs> John, do you want to go on an open water swim in the ocean with me? Yeah, let's go in the ocean. <laughs> Sounds great. Nice two mile swim. And to we'll be clear too, like I, I've like spent a lot of time surfing in my life too, when I lived by the beach and stuff. So like, I'm comfortable not dying mostly in the water. Right. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> mostly, but like when I, when you talk about like swimming and technique and everything else, and then like the physical exertion that comes on top of that, that's when everything gets more complex for sure. So yeah. Chad, yeah. So are you, you want to make sure swimmer? you're oh. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Amber. Amber Give tip. the tips. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you want to be able to, it's, it's just like cycling or any other skill. You want to be able to nail that skill in a low pressure environment before you try it in a high pressure environment. Yes. So and especially swim. with, you know, I, <laughs> the I, woman I, in the deep end is a sink or swim. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Literally. They wants to take me to the top of the proverbial chairlift and just drop me down like a black diamond run. I think is what they wants to do. So yeah. pretty much Re repay the favor as only would be kind. Right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, are you, you're, you're a good swimmer. You've, you, used to do that somewhat regularly, like go and swim laps and stuff. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm a very inexperienced swimmer though. So I started, uh, in the triathlon team or the triathlon club at UNR or university in Nevada in Reno. And we, they took us out to a 50 meter pool and said, swim to the other end and come back. Cause they wanted to get a sense of how well people swim. It was, it took a long time. It was, a, it was, a, it was a long out and back and it, it involves stopping and standing and getting going again. So that's where I started. And then uh, yeah, I went to a uh, practice at a gym, which was a, a much shorter pool. I think 20, uh, either way, it was a much shorter pool and I didn't really do any fitness swimming. I did a ton of drilling. And at the time I was out the bat, uh, I was all about the total immersion drills and, you know, you can have your opinion over, or, over them, regardless of what it is, they worked for me. They worked really well. And because I did exactly what Amber's describing right now, I just drilled for him, drilled for him, drilled for him. I didn't do a heck of a lot of swimming, but I picked up a lot of body balance techniques, breathing techniques, uh, wasn't using any equipment aside from a kickboard. But the point is I, I came from a point where I couldn't get across a, a pool and back to where I could swim indefinitely, not quickly, but with reasonably good form and, and it paid big dividends, but geez, that was 20 years ago. So I got to, but Amaret likes my my natural ability. She's watched me do a couple things and and thinks she's got moldable clay. So we'll see. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you have a, you have a, you have in your family you have a built-in coaching uh, system there with swimming. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Amaret's it's, really good. It's a good thing. <clears throat> yeah, I, I the one thing that I am excited about is it seems as if swimming is very technique heavy. Like that's mm -hmm. like a, a the as a sport 
uh, perhaps even more so than just like road cycling in particular. So oh, yeah. as hundred times like, more. Yeah. yeah. And if any, sure. that's like a relative strength for me is technique in, mm -hmm. in different things. It's Same. like figuring out the techniques. And I, I think I have pretty like, uh, whether it's natural or develop, but proprioception is usually pretty high as well. So hopefully that means that I can learn this quickly. Oh, I shouldn't say hopefully. I don't like saying that. I will learn this quickly because I will focus on technique. There we go. Yeah. Do, <laughs> do or do say, not, Jonathan. Yes, thank you, you have, Chad. <laughs> you have amazing body awareness. And, and the, the trick is just going to be getting your brain used to working in, in an environment where um, there's just less gravity, you know, and yeah. the orientation. You're, it's basically like you're just shifting your frame of reference and as soon as your as soon as your brain learns to shift into a new frame of reference with your body awareness and your engine, it's going to come super super fast. So it's really mm -hmm. just about getting yourself in that new frame of reference over and over again with a lot of focus and a lot of quality, you know, attention. And then, yeah, sky's the limit. You're going to be great. Before someone writes in, Amber did not mean less gravity; she meant more buoyancy. More Same amount of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> Same amount of yeah, exactly. Feels like less just gravity. Just wait, I will yes. change gravity. <laughs> it's all over. We're just gonna defy so. physics here on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, Thank well, you, Nate. Uh, that was a good good catch. Amber Wait, and someone write in, you know it. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, sure. Amber does They're not already realize. typing Actually. right there. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks uh, to you three for the tips. Thanks to the folks in the live chat for the tips and everybody else. If you want to send me tips, go find me on Instagram. Um, all, all are welcome. <clears throat> so, and find everybody else here on there. Uh, let's go into David's question. He says, love the podcast. I have a newbie XC racing race strategy question. I'm 39. I've been riding mountain bikes since my early twenties. I live in North Carolina, so we've got a lot of great areas. And that's true, by the way, North Carolina for mountain biking, it's like heaven and it's not really talked about. Oh my gosh, they have so much riding there. It's really cool. And a ton of variety. It's like um, the typical East Coast stuff. Then they have like kind of smooth, more West Coast style riding too. It's really cool. So it says that I've been dabbling in trainer road for about one and a half years and yo-yo between 170 to 190 FTP. Uh, I seem to train in spurts mixed with three to four outside rides per week, all mountain biking. I know I'll be faster if I train more, he says, but I'm on the Nate plan. He calls it right now. <laughs> so Nate's Check training my, uh, a lot. Strava, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Get on that plan, Nate says. <laughs> tried doing those uh, big workouts. <laughs> uh, so he says, anyway, I've started doing some of the local XC races in the beginner and cat three class. I have some races where I finish third and others. I basically just end up blowing up and trying to finish. I try to watch my average heart rate and it seems that my current, if, if my current heart rate is above 180, I can't hold that very long. If my average heart rate is above 173, I'm probably pushing my limit and will probably blow up. Yes. And he says, yes, Chad, I know if I train at least three times per week, I'll be faster and better at a better adapted to these hard efforts. And that's the truth, right? Chad, more training makes you faster. Um, yeah. <laughs> so got to watch YouTube to see what Chad just did. Um, okay. So, uh, he says my question how do you learn to pace yourself so that you don't just blow up? I find that the race pace is different from my normal pace. So how can I better train to know when I can push and when I can't, I know experience is part of this, but I'd love to hear your tips. And he also says, PS, I don't have power data, just a Garmin head unit with a heart rate monitor. Thanks from David. Chad, do you want to start us off on this one? And then we can go to Nate maybe. Yeah, I, I can simply and shortly reiterate what I've said a number of times is that all the information that we have accessible is super useful, but it should always be with the aim of cultivating an understanding of what everything feels like. So use data to inform your perception. So, I mean, and, and it could be as simple as spending a lot of time looking at your, your head unit. So when you're on a 2% grade, look down, oh, okay, this is a 2% grade. And then over time, <clears throat> you'll just be riding on a grade and you'll think, oh, this feels like a 2% grade. You look down, sure enough, it's 2% grade. And that carries to a lot of things, to, to speed, a little tougher, to power output, super important. To, I mean, you can start to relate perceived exertion to how hard does, does this effort level, this, this uh, percentage of your FTP feel on certain days. And just, I mean, you're just looking at data a ton, but making sense of it, not just, not just building your catalog of, of data so that you can pull certain findings from that at some point, but in real time, looking at it and making associations. Mm. Yeah. That's uh, data informs perception. Yeah. Nate, okay. what, what would you give for advice here? Uh, opposite David, don't display your heart rate <laughs> while you're racing. Um, <laughs> training fine but i see so many people get in their heads in the racing and it's like the heart rate is telling them well first you can't pace off heart rate because it reacts slowly 
And at the beginning of the race, you're like, oh, I got to get to 180. Oh, I'm only at 160. I can go harder. I can go harder, <laughs> especially for those first five minutes of a mountain bike race. Uh, your adrenaline is going and it, it, everything feels easy. And about it takes about John Wright five minutes. Yeah, and three to like, five minutes. And then it's just boom, boom. Like yeah. you can hear the explosions. It's like a 4th of July fireworks show. <laughs> and, and let me be clear real quick, David. Everything I just said was in reference to training, not racing. Yeah. Pacing by data is, is a terrible idea in racing. <laughs> so I would say in a XC race, the first five minutes purposely go too slow. Um, like you're like, this is too slow for me. Uh, it can feel like try to aim for like a tempo feeling. And I bet that tempo is your threshold for those five minutes <laughs> and, yes. and try that. And then have you guys seen that too, where people like they obsess over their heart rate and heart rate can be so variability, so variable oh, yeah. on different days based on what's happened, especially in a race mm -hmm. where they're like, I can't do this. Or it can also be, um, they can get upset because they can't get their heart rate high enough and they mm -hmm. keep going harder and harder and harder and it doesn't raise and that blows them up. Um, it's more, it's not, it shouldn't guide to what you're doing. It's like a, a response of what you're doing. And the, but there's all these other factors that factor in that you don't know about why your heart is doing this, or you not, might not be aware of. So I would record the data, but just not see it during the race. Um, and that's pretty much it. Just don't go hard in the first five minutes. And after that, I think people can, for the rest of the hour, hour and 20 minutes, you can kind of pace yourself pretty well because you've already got that massive adrenaline and anaerobic fueled effort out of the way. Great advice, Nate. Yeah. Amber, what would you say for something like this? Cause this isn't just unique to mountain biking. It's also with road racing and the hard starts or you, when you're talking about the classics, it's like getting into that key position, that sort of a thing. Um, how would you, his question, how do you learn to pace yourself so that you don't just blow up, especially when that race pace is different than his normal pace? Right. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I really like what Chad was saying about being able to read how you're feeling in real time. And I always talk about feeling the sensations, like what is, what are the, getting familiar with the sensations of actually like really pushing your limits. And that's not something that we normally do in typical workouts, right? Like we're, we're training specific training zones when we're working out and it's really hard to push yourself in training on your own as, as, as hard as you can when you're in a competition and there's competitors and there's an actual race and you're in the competitive arena. And that's one of the beauty that's one of the most beautiful things I think about competition is, is that you get into that headspace that's very, very different from where you are in training. So it is hard to train. Um, but I, I would really, um, zero in on what the sensations are in training, because that's something, you know, you can do. So if you're feeling in a race, the way you feel in training, you know, you're well within your capacity. Right. And I think it's important to experiment with going beyond that in a race, allowing yourself to dig deep, do it without fear. Yes. Sometimes you are going to blow up, but you're not going, but there will be times where you dig really deep and you think that's it. That was a race ending effort. And somehow you're able to pull out more and it will mm -hmm. happen for you at some point if it ha hasn't already. And for that reason, when you're in a race and you feel like you're doing what might be a race ending effort and you're thinking, this is it, this is all I have left. Don't give up. Just, you know, talk yourself into, do I have one more effort? One more, five more seconds, three more seconds, whatever it happens to be. Or can I hang on this wheel over one more incline? Whatever, you know, if you can break it down and just hang in for a little bit longer, um, in road racing, what'll typically happen. And I know, th know this is different from mountain bike racing, but you might be going with a surge and just thinking there is no way that I can hold this. And then the next thing, you know, the pace lifts anyway, and you're fine. But if you had given up half a second earlier, you would have lost the group. So if you can just talk yourself into a little more, a little more during the races, you might discover that it's not a pacing issue so much as learning that you can go deeper than you thought you, you, than, than you thought. Um, but you have to give yourself a chance to go that extra step and then see just how much longer you can hang in it and breaking it down into little increments can really help. And just because you blew up in one race, doesn't mean that you aren't going to pull out an amazing performance in the next one. Every race is really, really different. So, um, I wouldn't put too much stock in a bad day. Um, but look and figure out what you can learn from that and what you can bring forward. Mm. If you, I, I think <clears throat> this has been great advice across the board. I think there's a hard thing that exists, especially with cat three racing, where you have expectations and reality and they are not the same and you set your expectations too high. 
because everybody starts the race <clears throat> with high hopes, especially with cat three, because there's a lack of experience, but we all see, you know, Yolanda Neff win an amazing race and Nino Scherter win an amazing race. So we're just them in our minds, right? That's what we're aiming to do. But the fact is, if your expectations are trying to make you achieve something that are far from what you actually can achieve, you'll always be dissatisfied and you'll end up blowing up all the time and wondering why you're blowing up. And it's not that it's not a physical problem as much as it is an expectations problem. Now, it, like you said, also in this case, David, that you're simply just trained doing what you're doing for training. You know that if you trained more, you could get faster. So if you trained more and you could get faster, you might be able to win. But since you aren't doing that, you should make sure that your expectations are properly set for where you want to finish and where you think you'll finish in the race. Cause that will really help you, uh, it, because it makes it so that you actually can do what Nate said. Cause otherwise when you start the race and if your expectations are that you're going to finish at the front, you're going to go really hard to stay with that front group and you'll blow yourself up and it will feel, and you'll be killing yourself inside when you just say, Nope, sit in, go easy, let them go. I'll catch them later. That'll be really hard for you if you haven't said, okay, it's fine. They're in a different group. They're, they have different expectations, different goals. I have my own goals. So you just have to make sure that your expectations are aligning with what you can achieve. And that will make it so that you can actually execute on that when you're not in a very clear head state, headspace when you're out there on the course. So, yeah, I was going to say Amber's Amber's advice, I think is really good for road racing, but sorry, Amber, I would not follow it for XC <laughs> racing. If mm -hmm. I would not be like, oh, I can just hold on five more seconds to this group. Because the, there's not the drafting or the slowing down that there is inside of road racing, where road racing is much more dynamic. Mountain bike race, man, I with John, it is just the same pace for like the entire <laughs> thing. It is, yeah. it's, it's, it's more like a triathlon or a marathon or it's a like half a time marathon. trial. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's not a time an evenly trial. paced one. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a time trial with yeah with a lot of hills and descents and with no draft very little drafting and a mountain bike and especially too the most important part David at the very beginning of the race everyone's going to surge and that's okay and in, I would even try a race where you don't surge at the beginning and maybe you do get stuck behind some people slower on single track but uh, that will automatically pace you mm -hmm. that then you can maybe have a faster second and third lap than your first lap which is very important. Yeah. I mean, that, that'd be a good goal to go after. That's where you pass the yeah. most people. It's not in the beginning. It's toward the end of the race. And one thing I want to, I want to do a hybrid of what Amber said and Nate said, because I think Amber's advice is hugely beneficial in the latter half of that race. So in the beginning half, you don't want to have that. I can keep going. I can hold on. I no. cause if you're yeah. on your limit already, <laughs> you're going to nuke right. And, and, and the race will be over. But what Amber said is so important at the end of the race, because at that point, you've likely settled into a sustainable pace, right? Like, because you've probably just been brought down to your knees and that's just where you can be. So <laughs> at that point, that is what you can do. And that's when that grit is really important that like making, like finding new, like pushing your boundaries, pushing your limits. That's when that is really important. And it particularly as well, I think that that becomes more appropriate as you get closer to the pointy end of the field. Like that's where that, those small things of like tricking your head into thinking that you can hold that for just a little bit more on that last lap, that may be the difference maker. So I think it is like a super important headspace to have that you can do more than perhaps your body is telling you at that moment. But the bad time to do it is on the opening lap or on the start, the good time to start to apply that is as the race goes on. That's when you really yeah, want to have that grit. Dig Another way of what I was saying, and and Nate, thank you for making that point about the the group because that's so true. It's it's very different in mountain biking from road riding. What I mean to say is that sometimes you'll dig, you'll have to dig really deep, even in a race like a mountain bike race where it is mostly time trial. You might have to really put out a ton of power just to get up a really steep section, not because there's somebody next to you, but because you either have to put out a huge amount of power or fall over <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Or, or maybe it is a key section and you're on a fire road and there's a huge long single track section coming up and you need to surge to get yourself in position. There are going to be points where you do have to dig really deep and it's going to be above threshold and some maybe a little bit deeper than you really want to go to keep an even pace. Um, what I mean to say is sometimes when you do a really hard effort like that, and you think you've blown up and you convince yourself, that's it, I'm done, you back off 50, 60, 70%. But what if you only backed off 2% or 
you might actually still be able to recover or 5% or 10% or whatever it is, but not just mentally giving up and throwing in the towel, but saying, okay, you know, I need to recover a little bit, but I'm not going to soft pedal. I need to recover a little bit, but I'm not giving up. And you just back off a little bit instead of completely checking out mentally. Um, mm. So yeah, it's not about staying with a group in a mountain bike race, but it is still about trusting yourself that you can recover without completely throwing in the towel. Mm. I just, all this talk makes me think of Chad at Cape Epic. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that nate <laughs> please expound <laughs> um i think the first day chad's going to be like wow that was so much fun and he's going to be amped because it's a prologue day, right it's like a it's like an hour, hour roughly yeah super fun it's beautiful fire roads one scary descent that's it and then after that i just i don't think chad you're gonna, you're gonna finish right <laughs> oh jeez <laughs> oh, oh chad's muted, muted. Chad's muted. Yep. Sorry there we that. go, Chad. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, in a answer to Nate's question, I want to get back to <laughs> David's question and, and apologize because David, I kind of lost focus and I didn't even address your question. Everything I was talking about utilizing the data in training to inform your perception will eventually bring you ideally to a place where that data is unnecessary, where you're actually going by feel. So you don't have to wonder about these things. You know yourself because you've used that data to build your understanding of what you can and cannot sustain. And then the race situation is going to bring out those situations, uh, those instances where you think I can't do this, but you show yourself you can't basically to, to further Amber's, Amber's earlier points. So use the data in training, don't rely heavily in, in racing. And then, and then Nate, I don't, I don't really have an answer for your question. I I'm building my fitness and I'm, I'm really looking at Cape Epic as an opportunity to go and ride bikes in Africa for eight days in a row. So it's, it's pretty much a win-win. I, are, are Even all of I us going to be brought down to that level at some point in this race, right? Or we're just like, no. well, it's still a race. We'll it's still a race. I don't want to just phone it in, but it, <laughs> sure. I'm seeing it for the opportunity that it is. It's not, it's not an imposition. It's not something I have to go do. It's something I get to go do. Sophia right. already messaged me, I think twice, like we're going to, we're going to, we're trying to win. Uh, that's why I'm trying to up my, my, my uh, workouts. Top five would be cool for the co-ed for us, but on um, even more so. So if you take Dave's question and you take it into terms of stage race, mm. eight day stage race, it's even more pacing and day two, I think personally, this will be really hard because Sophia won't let this happen and I'll just do what she says. But <laughs> I think on day one, there is. But it, there's an all out hour effort that blows you up for three days, right? And then there's a 95 to Amber's point, a 95% hour effort that maybe you lose two minutes, but you can then, you could train the next day. And then there's on each one of those days with eight days, you all probably experienced it. You can do sweet spot many days in a row, but if you do one day of over unders and then try to do sweet spot that next day, like you have to turn down the workout. Uh, so there can be a little exuberance on that, those first couple of days that makes your whole race less like your, your, the whole race is slower. Um, but it's hard because everyone else is going so fast. They're going to start the race fast. You're going to see people go up like Chad's going to see Sophie and I go up the road and <laughs> I sure am. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not being unrealistic. I'm not going to try to cover stuff. I can't because to your point, you got to see the big game, the, the entire picture. It's yeah, eight yeah. days of racing. And if I blow myself up on the first day or two, I probably won't finish. And I have every intention of finishing it. And I have every yeah. intention of enjoying myself as much as possible, considering how long the days are. I mean, I know each day is going to involve a little bit of love and a little bit of hate. I'm, I'm just going to try to veer more toward the former. Remember yeah. single track six? Oh, I, vividly. <laughs> single track three. <laughs> yes, like scarred. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was hard. That was when that yeah, was and, shorter days. And that is exactly yeah. the mistake. On the very first day, I went so deep that I was cramping to uh, debilitated by cramps with what 20 minutes of racing left to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine yeah. if you could do days six, seven, eight, like air quotes, the hardest days. <clears throat> yeah, ideally. ideally. John, what are your what, what about you? I think that there's uh so the reality that I faced is that I'm gonna be spending a huge amount of time riding at tempo, feeling like that's threshold. Uh, and feeling like that's higher at times. Like that's when you do that many days in a row of these long demanding hard efforts, that's just what happens. Like you're just not as you, you don't recover as much. 
yarn is strong and you end up doing that. So, um, I, I think that giving the race, I think their respect that it's due. I think that finishing Cape Epic is a challenge regardless of, 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 you know, uh, maybe if you're Nino, it's not, I don't know, but finishing a Cape Epic is a challenge. So going in and thinking that I can ride it how I want just right off the bat, I think would be foolish. So mm. yeah, plan is not plan is to pace myself conservatively. Brandon is going to be faster on the climbs. Uh, my teammate, he's, he's ripping, he's getting really fast again. So, and he's also really, really upped his descent game. And I think that just like with climbing with the descents, you also don't want to be pushing at hundred percent just because you're not in a sharp headspace that many days into a race, those sort of mm-hmm. long rides, the fatigue really adds up and it removes that sort of, uh, the level of proficiency that usually carries you through tricky situations you kind of have to shoot below yourself in that regard too. So I think it'll be, uh, I think for me, it'll feel probably harder than it will feel for Brandon most of the time because his descending is, is definitely getting better too. So I don't think it's going to be like fully restful there, but I'm, I'm extremely excited for it. I think it's going to be, it's a huge accomplishment that I really want to be able to, uh, to do. And I have no clue where Brandon and I will finish though. And I, I'm not even caring about the placement relative to other people. I just want us to be able to have like a race where we feel like I care. Yo. Yeah, but you guys are in co-ed. You know what I mean? Like, no, I care for you and for Chad. This is I don't a competition, even... <laughs> not let's go on an adventure. Like, well, no, relative to you guys, we're going to smoke all of you. We know that already, but <laughs> it's it's relative to the rest of the field. I don't know because I think that it's extremely competitive, right? Like yeah. having two, um, I think it's male uh, that we would be in like the male uh, group, uh, pairs or duo. It's a really competitive field, so... Mm. I don't think that we can like say like we're going to be top 10 or anything else that I don't know, but I know that we're going to give it. So top 10 would be a good goal. Cause it is, I don't think a win is likely. It's almost like a I world mean, championship. Yeah. Top 10 would be amazing. Yeah. That'd be, that'd well, be astounding. I mean, to your point, Jonathan, just finishing is an accomplishment. I mean, let alone the luck that needs to be involved. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot that can go wrong over the course of an event that, that that's a, that's that long and B that that's, a, that's that grueling over such harsh terrain. I mean, there's a, <laughs> yeah, yes. it's just, it's no joke. It's no joke. S- speaking of that, who's sending in their suspension to get service beforehand. Have you thought about that? And have you looked at the lead times? Ooh. If you haven't, I would do that just because it's a no, no, Nate just like shrugged it off. The thing is like, if you don't service your suspension and you have stiction and I know that y'all of you are like, yeah, nerdy suspension stuff. But if that's causing your suspension to not work fluidly, that sort of stuff destroys your hands, arms, shoulders, neck, back. It makes your body really sore because all those things that it should be absorbing and your suspension still feels like it works, but it's losing that suppleness and it tears you apart and particularly hands. Like I've actually been like, uh, I think that I need to do more North star days because doing those hard, rough trails over and over my hands get destroyed, but it makes them tougher thereafter. And I need that because I don't know if you remember this in single track six, I got blisters and that caused a terrible cascade. And if you do that and your suspension's really rough, that only makes that whole problem worse. So I'm actually sending mine off now. And then I'm planning on sending it off again, uh, before we go though, to, to get it done. I think it's a bit, I think it's a super important thing. Don't sleep on that. So for what it's worth, Jonathan, I love your nerdy mountain bike stuff because I've learned so much from you. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Nerdsy night. <laughs> and Speaking Jonathan, of nerds, stuff, to go to the manufacturer that can't go to a shop. It can go to a shop. There are a lot of suspension oh. service shops that will do it. Oh. And it's not like a big deal or anything. You just send in your fork and your shock and they do it. And particularly for your bike, nothing's proprietary for an eight and I. It's trickier on the Epic. It's proprietary. Mm. So we have to send it to either specialized or we have to send it to like a certified shop, I believe, uh, to be able to work on it. So but for yours, it's, it's easy and you don't live in Reno anymore, but the Fox uh, suspension service center is here in Reno too. So you just drop it off and pick it up. It's really quick, but so, uh, but speaking of nerdy stuff, Chad, your deep dive, let's get into it. Um, <laughs> this out. is from <laughs> Nate's tuning, Nate just waved. He's tuning out. This He's is getting, uh, from, so this is, uh, an anonymous question submitter says, Please, uh, oh, forgive me. He says, I'm a 28 year old male category two road cyclist, maintaining a moderately six or stressful lifestyle on t- almost successful lifestyle. I'm sorry. Stressful lifestyle on top of training 10 to 15 hours per week. 
I understand generally that cortisol or cortisol and testosterone leads to DHT. What does he mean by DHT, Chad? It's dihydrotestosterone. We'll Got cover it. that in great depth. All right. <laughs> he says, which leads to male pattern baldness. I would love to reverse the trend of my thinning hair, but I think I love winning bike races more. Honestly, I wish I was bald. I'll trade with you. It'd be great to just never have to worry about hair. Um, he says, will commercially available hair loss treatments like finasteride, I believe is how you uh, uh, pronounce that, which act on the testosterone DHT pathway have an impact, positive or negative, on my cycling training and performance? So coaches, please help me stand on the top step with a luscious head of hair. <laughs> so um, we're honestly the podcast to come to for this. Nate has great <laughs> hair, great hair. Chad is on the opposite end of the spectrum, but he has insight to add nonetheless. Um, <laughs> Ch Chad, and uh, of course, Amber has fantastic hair too. So um, We Chad, talked about it before the podcast. We did. She's got a lot of volume today. It's wonderful. Voluminous. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, so Chad, uh, this asks questions about cortisol, testosterone, a DHT, and then if those medications affect that and thusly affect your recovery or performance adaptations, all that stuff. So where do you want to start with this? Well, well, first off, I want to go back to our uh, anonymous uh, caller. Uh, one line in particular stood out to me. It said, I understand generally that cortisol to testosterone yields DHT, which leads to male pattern baldness. And that's based on the understanding I've accumulated throughout the research. It's not exactly right. So I want to, I want to break that down because there is actually a fair amount to unpack here. I mean, we got to talk about cortisol, got to talk about testosterone, and then we got to talk about the ratio between the two before we can even really delve into how it affects baldness and how baldness may affect the treatment of baldness may affect training, et cetera. So it's quite a lot. So, uh, and it's early in the podcast. Nate probably doesn't have to whiz yet, but if you need to go, <laughs> Nate, that'd be the time. Already have. <clears throat> okay. Oh, gross. So, <laughs> it's in diapers or something comfy. over there. He has a his chair. <laughs> That's an image. I'll not get out of my mind anytime soon. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, Chad. Okay. <laughs> so that happened. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's a bad visual. <laughs> a real line here. Okay, so let's start with cortisol. In particular, what it is and what it isn't. So first off, cortisol is a steroid hormone, a glucocorticoid, a catabolic hormone. So, you know, something that's responsible for the breakdown of a substrate or something, you know, uh, big molecules into smaller molecules. But what it isn't, is usually harmful in its natural role. It isn't necessarily, isn't usually harmful, but for whatever reason, that's, that's the, the, uh, the idea everyone has gotten and there are particular reasons for that. But in terms of it not being harmful in its natural role, a good example is that glucocorticoids themselves are known to be potent antioxidants and potent immunosuppressive agents. And you hear immunosuppression, you think, why would I want to suppress the immune system? Well, in the case of allergic reactions, you, you very much do. So cortisone shots are often used for that very thing. Yeah. Um, one study back from 2008 by Hagney and colleagues even noted that by attempting to suppress the production of cortisol at rest or during exercise may actually compromise adaptive capabilities. So we're actually working against ourselves by trying to limit something that we don't really understand if, if, if that's our, our aim. Cortisol is involved in adaptation to exercise stress, to my point here. And an example would be the, the, the catabolic actions in muscle cells do actually break down muscle proteins. That's real. But these can be used via, via various mechanisms, one of them being gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose in the liver from non-carbohydrate substrate, so non-carbs making, making blood sugar for energy. Secondly, it's used to augment what's termed the free amino acid pool. So the idea being that this pool exists and that the damaged proteins that, that uh, occur from you know, exercise and any other thing that breaks down muscle tissue are broken down into recyclable components that are later used for synthesis of new proteins. <laughs> proteins. So proteins. this is, <laughs> this, <laughs> protein. this goes good, like Chad. Protein. That's a good accent. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is the very nature of protein balance, right? The whole degradation versus synthesis. If it's, if we're leaning toward the degradation side, we're in negative protein balance, leaning toward the synthesis size, positive. So it, just because we're breaking down muscle protein doesn't mean we're losing muscle. It's going into a pool that could be used, could very well be used to regenerate. So all our protein that does synthesize muscle tissue doesn't necessarily come from our diet. Some of it comes from our body and it's not a bad thing, not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. 
<clears throat> cortisol is crucially important in exercise. It, it, it works on so many levels. It has so many functions, a number of them that I'm about to go into intensification of that gluconeogenesis that I just talked about. So creation of glucose in the liver from other things than carbohydrate activation of your hepatic glycogen stores. So, you know, breaking down the glycogen that's stored in your liver so that we can fuel the muscles, mobilization of amino acids, kind of just touched on that simulation of lipolysis, which is the breakdown of, you know, stored triglycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol backbones that go into the process of gluconeogenesis and yield glucose. And it's linked to hunger cues. So, so to put all this really simply, it, it helps provide materials that are necessary for the production of energy. And it also helps us with the motivation for intake. You know, it prompts us to eat, hmm. especially important during an endurance event. And actually, Chad, if I, and this is also, that's, that's particularly important. Like you said, during an endurance event, and also just through training cycles, endurance athletes, it's, we have this complicated relationship with food and we can kind of push ourselves to ignore a lot of these signals and even some repatterning can happen with eating disorders. So, so once again, these important things like you're talking about here, uh, the, they're there for a reason, right. And they help us. Yep. Yeah. Your body's cues, uh, you know, you can ignore them, but at, at your own peril in a lot of mm -hmm. cases. Okay. So, so also, uh, and, and it sounds counter to everything I just mentioned, but cortisol is responsible for the sparing of glucose, glucose and glycogen. And this is part of its anti-anabolic nature. So it's catabolic, right? In that it breaks down, but anti-anabolic is the other side of things where it uh, prevents things from building in the terms, in, in this case, it'd be glycogen, right? We don't want to take that blood glucose and chain it together and create glycogen somewhere. We actually want to use it. So it plays a role in preventing that from happening. In, at inopportune times. So to put all this another way, it, it mobilizes us to fight stress by doing three things amongst others, ensuring stable delivery of glucose to the working muscles, stimulating tissue regeneration. So that muscle protein synthesis we just talked about and inhibiting, inhibiting inflammatory processes. So another thing it is, is intensity dependent. So cortisol release is actually relative to the level of effort. And that's interesting in and of itself. And most papers pin that at between 50 and 60% of VO2 max. A uh, number of them put it at greater than 60% of VO2 max, anything above that. And you're going to see an uptick in circulating cortisol. But the point is moderate to high intensity work. You're going to see an increase in circulating cortisol. But what's important to note is that this threshold can increase with training. So the more exercise trained you are, the more blunted your cortisol response is. So maybe before it happened at 60% and then you trained a bunch and it happens at 62, 65, 68, whatever. Hmm. So the, the important thing, or I'm sorry, uh, moving on, that's with <laughs> low and moderate intensity. When it comes to low intensity work, I'm sorry, moderate yeah. and high intensity work. When it comes to low intensity work, it, it, we'll get a cortisol uptick there too, but that's duration dependent. And this may be the best case for a little bit of amino acid supplementation in carbohydrate drink, right? So if you're on a long ride or a long run where you know you're going to be running low on fuel, well, this is a strong argument for inc including some amino acids into that, that uh, nourishing mixture. What's interesting is that circulating cortisol declines in short duration, low intensity exercise though. So this is kind of counter to what we think. And it's mm. kind of similar to the way blood lactate works. So if you look at a lactate curve, I mean, we see it hovering at a, at a level and then it just goes up as exercise intensity increases. Right. But what you don't see is if that same athlete being measured were measured sitting on that exercise bike, but not pedaling or standing on the treadmill, but not yet running. Once they start to work, lactate dips because it's being utilized. And similar to those VO2 uptake connects that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, it's that lag between what the body's demanding and what the body's furnishing. There's a little communication gap is being utilized. The body realizes it's being utilized and it needs to replace it. And then we get the uptick and then the eventual, you know, sustained increase. Okay. Additionally, uh, cortisol is involved in harmful physiological processes. This is true, but it's when it's at high persistent levels. So persisting high levels is the key term here. And in that case, yeah, inhibition of bone formation, issues with calcium absorption, those two go hand in hand, potentially insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, which is, you know, unfavorable blood lipid levels, hypertension or, uh, you know, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, pretty general term, but muscle weakness, slow wound healing, increased risk of infection, all of these things happen, but they assume that there's a malfunction in what's the negative feedback system of the whole cortisol delivery system, which is your HPA axis. 
So your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland, and your adrenal systems, your, your adrenal glands all work together via this negative feedback system. A production of one thing leads to a production of another, leads to a production of another. Once that last thing builds up to a point, it leads to a decrement in the thing that produced it and so on down the line. So this, this feedback loop is working at all times. When that malfunctions, you see things that, that mimic or are something like Cushing's uh, syndrome where you get an overproduction of, of, of cortisone, but athletes simply don't reach levels anywhere near this. And I linked to a study or a review actually that, that covers this in, in great detail. It's pretty interesting. Uh, furthermore, even people with excessive psychological stress or anxiety disorders typically exhibit higher cortisol levels than athletes do. So, you know, the advice here is simply to, to manage your stress, to recognize that there are a lot of things that are, with, that are within your control outside of training that can influence your, your levels of uh, persistent cortisol. Two more things. So cortisol is potentially influenced by diet. And this is an, uh, an important side note that uh, things like several days of low carbohydrate intake can increase your cortisol response to exercise. Similarly, so can temperature, extreme hot, extreme cold can actually increase circulating levels of cortisol. So it changes that cortisol response to exercise depending on uh, environmental characteristics. Okay, so it, much shorter because we've covered testosterone in the past, I'm just gonna run through, you know, what, what are some typical actions that we associate with testosterone? Um, obviously it influences muscle mass, fat distribution, red blood cell production, bone mass. And these are all the things that are relevant to this discussion and relevant to us as endurance athletes. Many other things though, but there are different types of testosterone. So there's free testosterone, which isn't bound to any other proteins, and it is the most accessible for activity. So again, the most relevant to us. And then there's bound testosterone. Some of it's bound to albumin, which is the, the protein in your blood, and some of it's born, uh, bound to uh, sex hormone binding globulin, and in both cases, rendered inactive. So the big concern is that a reduction in testosterone is going to signal a reduction in all the anabolic goings on. That's what we're concerned with. So, you know, the question then becomes, what are, what are the ways to increase testosterone? And this, again, we've covered in the past, so I'm going to be quick. Increase your physical activity, pretty straightforward. Exercise, weight training. I mean, add that to the long list of reasons why you need to figure out how to balance the, the, the demands of weight training with the demands of endurance training in order to become a better endurance athlete. And then high intensity interval training, you know, both things that are very familiar and, and dear to the hearts of us as uh, trainer road subscribers, mm -hmm. users. <clears throat> okay, so now back to the interrelation between cortisol and testosterone. Uh, one study back in 2005 actually demonstrated a negative relation between cortisol and total testosterone. News to nobody, but what was a bit in, uh, surprising was that there's a positive relation between cortisol and free testosterone. So something that flies entirely counter to, to what we all think we understand about this ratio, but what that tells us or what that does is it begins raising questions around the utility of this testosterone cortisol ratio. Hmm. So let's talk about the ratio now, and then we'll get to the whole, the actual uh, question itself. So with regards to this testosterone cortisol ratio, this TC ratio, just how useful is this, what I consider to be a not too accessible metric. And I think most people would agree yeah. because well, 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 cortisol can be measured via the saliva, super, super easy, but you know, then you actually have to measure it and interpret it. Testosterone has to be measured via a blood draw. And this imposes certain limitations on anything you want to do real time and the frequency of the draws, because unless I'm mistaken, I don't think this is a blood draw akin to a, a fingertip or an earlobe prick. I think it's an actual draw. So the idea is that this is this information is going to be used to determine whether exercise generates a catabolic or an anabolic environment. And we're in a process of, you know, breaking things down when we don't want to be breaking them down. Um, or have we reached, you know, that anabolic end goal that we that you know furthers adaptation and therefore performance. So uh, to get into the weeds for just a second, and not that far. Structurally alike hormones actually compete for receptor binding sites. And, and if you think back to when we talked about caffeine, how, you know, adenosine over the course of a day binds to these particular receptors and we get sleepier and sleepier and eventually go to bed, we can block those receptors because caffeine is a similarly structured hormone. So it slips in there and it blocks that adenosine from accumulating and, you know, we get our little bump in wakefulness. 
So testosterone is on the anabolic side and, and also the anti-catabolic side, which is not an opposite. They're, they're, they're two mildly different things. And then cortisol is on the catabolic side or the anti-anabolic side. And, and it's going to be the preponderance of one over the other, this testosterone to cortisol ratio, that's going to determine whether or not we're in a largely synthetic or uh, degradation, uh, state of degradation. However, numerous challenges to using this so-called stress metric exist. I mean, so many things can influence cortisol. So your acute training, so the training that you just did can change it. Uh, the training effects training effects. So everything you've done up to a point. So the last days, weeks, months of training can affect it. Your motivation can affect it. Just how switched on are you regarding what it is you're about to do? Even the competitive venue, knowing where you have to go can, can ramp you up. So it's really tough to use this, this ratios information to affect your training when you have so many potential sources, so many things that could be affecting it. How do you decipher which of those things is causing it such that you can modify your training? It's a great example. Sorry, Chad, if I can just interject here, this is a great example of, um, <clears throat> just because we can measure it doesn't mean that it can actually drive improvements. Right. Yes, entirely. And let alone, like you said, even like actually measuring them and interpreting them is, is difficult, but yep. just because we can measure it doesn't mean that it can drive performance. That's yeah. Yeah. Great. True. great it, point. it can just lead us down the, the wrong roads. I mean, there might be relevant information there, but determining what's relevant, what's not, uh, that's a, that's a pretty big challenge. So mm -hmm. again, the idea is that when we monitor this, this relationship, we can point to situations of overreaching and overtraining, you know, and steer the ship a different direction. Right. And yes, it's true. There does appear to be a linkage between resting testosterone and cortisol levels in endurance trained triathletes. And I linked to a particularly relevant study, but whether it's causal or associative, you know, whether it's, you know, correlation or, or cause that aside, exercise induced cortisol does appear to have a negative relationship with post-exercise total testosterone. But again, some studies look at free testosterone. Some studies look at total testosterone. So how, we can't, we can't balance those against one another. How do we pull findings from that? There are seasonal variations. So, you know, in, in our parlance, training adaptations, and these can influence it. So the more adapted we become, the, the less conversion of cortisol to cortisone, the inactive to the active forms. And I link to a paper if you want to nerd out on just exactly how those two <laughs> things play back and forth. Always. So with, uh, with athletes, cortisol levels rise, but then they level off at a higher, but still non, non detrimental level. So even a sustained uptick in cortisol may not be saying anything needs to change mm -hmm. again, you know, just, just another form of training adaptation add to this. There's a circadian influence on it that we got to account for. Think about, think of the waste, the, the waking response of cortisol. Think about teasing out the effects of your previous exercise load. So everything you've up, done up to a point and then upcoming stress, just the anticipation of what comes next can affect your cortisol. So we're looking at physical, psychological, physiological stressors that all affect circulating levels of cortisol. And then finally, exhaustive endurance exercise, which I'm sure we've all faced at one time or another, where you really run the ship into the, into the beach has a long recovery time course. It can take cortisol somewhere in the ballpark of two full days to reach base, to return to baseline levels. All the while the free testosterone can take more like three days to, to return to its level. And I linked to that study. And the point of that study is that this testosterone cortisol ratio is quite, is a questionable value in general, but especially during that acute recovery phase, look at it anytime within that three day window. And, and what is it going to tell you that's useful? So this is, uh, this is interesting because I get flooded with like, uh, which this is probably revealing a lot about my internet activity, but I get flooded with <laughs> ads that are always like, got belly fat, cortisol is mm -hmm. the enemy. And like, yeah. you know, that is like, <laughs> and cortisol is always pitched as this like terrible thing that you want none of, and yeah. that it comes about because you don't sleep and that's the problem, or it comes up because you don't eat the right way and any cortisol is bad, basically. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's marketable it's, because it plays on people's misunderstanding of what it's actually doing. And what you're showing here is that it's much more nuanced than that. And it has good purposes and it serves those purposes. And excess, just like of anything, is can be bad and can cause bad effects. But also another great takeaway with this, and I, Chad, I know we haven't even gotten to answering his question, but I just want to kind of summarize this. <laughs> it's coming. Another great takeaway to this is the fact that, um, so you have this thing, you can measure it, you can try to focus on it, you can do all that stuff, 
but then all the information you're getting, there's information for average people and there's information for athletes. And we receive marketing messaging all the time for both, but we see it for an average person. And many times we think that it applies to us as well, but an, an athlete that's training, that's working for something, doing that sort of thing is likely more balanced and is likely not dealing with the over accumulation, like you were talking about in this case, likely I should say. So once again, it, whatever you see, read, hear, everything else, the information, you have to take it with a grain of salt. If you're an active person that's training and doing that sort of thing, you're likely more regulated. Um, and the same advice may not need to apply for you versus a sedentary person. So um, awesome. So Chad, uh, how does the these hair loss drugs, because that's like every, and this is like a dude fear here. It's like, <laughs> can't sure. drop my T levels, man. <laughs> like, just uh, a dude fear. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's, yeah. And that's a good point too, but yeah, let's get into it. Okay. So, so with, you know, I hope a better understanding of testosterone cortisol and the ratio of how those two things relate. Let's look at how hair loss and, and the treatment of hair loss actually impact testosterone and, you know, therefore probably performance. So before we get started though, age, stress, diet, the ways you can supplement your diet, uh, exercise, hormones, all of these things can affect hair loss. Okay, so I'm not trying to ignore those other factors, but a genetic predisposition to male pattern baldness and in females, female pattern hair loss, um, scientifically referred to as uh, adrenogenetic alopecia, appears to be the leading driver. And, and, and the reason being is this DHT that, that we talked about or that, that we mentioned earlier that he asked about, that our anonymous subscriber asked about. This is... Uh, dihydrotestosterone and it too is an androgen which you know male sex hormone is probably not the best term for it because it doesn't apply simply to males females produce these hormones as well they just don't do it in this, typically they don't do it in the same high quantities um, it's a testosterone byproduct and it's produced by it sounds like i'm trying to get wordy and fancy here but five alpha reductase and that's an enzyme that's important because we're going to come back to it it's it's especially important in this discussion uh and this DHT is apparently five times more potent than testosterone, which if you read that, you think, oh, I definitely want more DHT. But the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, into DHT, takes place in the skin, in the liver, in the prostate, and in the hair follicles. Follicles. Of, of all the, I looked at 16 or so, I don't know, literally 16 papers uh, to, to varying degrees. And not once did I see anything about the conversion of testosterone to DHT within the muscle. So I do not think this has anything to do with muscular testosterone. So what it does is it binds the receptors in hair follicles and actually causes something termed miniaturization. Um, I also saw this, the term catagen, which is a phase of growth. I'm not sure if those two things are interchangeable, but they're certainly along the same lines, both of which lead to an eventual end of hair growth in those who are genetically susceptible to hair loss. So you may say I'm off the hook, I'm probably not genetically susceptible, but by the age of 50, the National Institutes of Health have uh, said that on the order of 50 million men and 30 million women in the US will be afflicted with either male pattern baldness or female pattern hair loss. So in a nutshell, the, your hair follicle sensitivity to DHT, DHT is in your genes. So, and what's interesting about this is that though it is responsible for hair loss, it's actually responsible for hair growth elsewhere on your body, less desirable locations, which is unfortunate, <laughs> but is what it is. Okay. So it, it, the, the literature seems to agree that DHT is the primary hormone responsible for hair loss. And the, so, so that makes the prevention rationale to, to block DHT in order to slow or prevent hair loss. And this can be done via you know, topical application, but the criticism there is that it doesn't fully block DHT binding. So drugs are another way to go. And this finast finasteride and, and then alternatively dutasteride, I'm probably pronouncing both those wrong, uh, linked to a particular study on that that actually shows that dutasteride in particular is not uh, in any way related to muscle loss or uh, any of the things that you might think if you limit testosterone, you'd be facing. So check that out if you're interested, but these drugs claim to actually block DHT and they, and they do this by blocking the conversion of testosterone to that dihydrotestosterone DHT by binding that enzyme that I mentioned earlier, that five alpha reductase. So they're referred to as five alpha reductase inhibitors. They stop the process, right? And they do so at the source. So DHT production never takes place. 
And this in turn stops most hair loss and can actually reverse miniaturization should it have, have occurred. Unfortunately, um, you got to catch it while it is in process because apparently once it's gone, it's gone forever. So the logic is that any increase in testosterone carries a potential increase in DHT. But again, the conversion of testosterone to DHT takes place in the liver, the skin, the prostate, and the hair follicles. Again, follicles. Again, I didn't see any apparent impact on muscles and their perf for performance in my reading. And I, I, I looked at a pretty wide date range and included quite a lot of papers. So, dear anonymous subscriber, I understand your logic, but my conclusion is that these medications don't look as though they'd impact your testosterone, only a, pro a byproduct of your testosterone, this DHT. And DHT seems to be aimed at other physiological processes anyway. And studies on both this finasteride and dutasteride, dutasteride didn't negatively impact fat-free mass or muscle strength, amongst other things that would be a concern for us as athletes. So the, by inhibiting this particular enzyme, this 5-alpha reductase, it really only impacts DHT, not free testosterone, not total, um, total testosterone. And if you'll allow me to speculate, I think if anything, that would mean that more testosterone is available since it's not converted to DHT. But I, I, I don't know for sure. So in my opinion, based on my reading, no apparent cause for concern. So with all that in mind, I have just a couple parting thoughts. And, and the first one uh, relates to that testosterone to cortisol re relation, because it, first off, as is it a cause of, of hair loss of decreases in performance? Very probably not. Um, the, the same ratio as a metric for overreaching overtraining waters are pretty muddy to say anything with any level of certainty. So I, I just don't think there's anything there. And then finally, I will personally recommend, and no, I'm not a doctor, but I am a <laughs> follicularly challenged male. <laughs> caffeine, caffeine. We've all seen Alpacin, right? I mean, giant Alpacin, right, yeah. Alpacin Phoenix. Yeah. And every time I see it, I think, come on, caffeine on your scalp, what's that going to do? It's actually a fair amount of research out there. And one review in particular noted that hair follicles kind of have their own HPA axis or at least a functional equivalent to it. And it can be affected by caffeine. I quote, uh, caffeine quote, counteracts testosterone induced growth inhibition and alone promoted hair shaft elongation in AGAHFs. So androgenetic alopecia hair follicles. So it grew hair. Another study in 2007, and though it was in vitro, so you know they did this outside of the body, identified caffeine as a stimulator of human hair growth and recognized its efficacy, efficacy the efficacy of a topical solution. So in my opinion, I'd, I'd much rather put something like this on my body than take a medication, it, it, but there's nothing to say you couldn't do both. And honestly, I ordered some of this up. I'm curious. I mean, I, I've got some miniaturization on particular parts of my head that I think I'd make me a, a very viable candidate for this treatment. So why not? It costs eight bucks and, you know, trainer robotic it because we talked about it on the podcast. So <laughs> I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> Can you imagine Chad with a full healthy, like Marcel Kittle head of hair pull my just hat comes out of the podcast and... next week. <laughs> Gives us a hair like tour. Works, a blonde, yeah. <laughs> that would be not, not likely, but, but I am curious. So to recap this, Chad, it sounds like, uh, basically DHT is what's affecting this hair growth. And you have testosterone and DHT being a byproduct of that. And the medicine, in this case, the medication that they're looking at looks at directly addressing DHT and likely doesn't affect testosterone levels. So in this case, it's likely not inhibiting recovery adaptation, everything else that athletes are concerned about in terms Good of their memory. role with testosterone. Yep. So cool. I, I never knew that about cortisol. I never had that straight, the response, its role, everything else like that. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. It's a much that. maligned reputation and unfairly so. Yeah. Uh, man, uh, Alpacin, they always sponsor riders with great hair teams with riders with great hair. Too. Right. They have Vanderpool I mean, now. You, you put Vanderpool hair. on top of, you know, basically any podium and okay, yeah. like Olympic, Olympic podium. So, if they have wild Van Air, then they would be like uh, yeah, a right. box checked. He even has like cool colors in his hair. He looks like storm from X-Men. So, um, okay. Let's go into some rapid fire questions. Watching uh, this one's from crystal. She says, watching beers with Chad, uh, I know of Chad's affinity for the Muppets. Do love <laughs> if, me some Muppets. If you know, you know. <laughs> but changing course slightly, what is your spirit Disney character and why? Hmm. I, I, I know the answer for me. 
Nate's face when you said Muppets was just just awesome. <laughs> All a little scarred. <laughs> I look back and I still can't believe we did that. Um, <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, I know mine. I, I think it's Peter Pan. I'm kind of like annoyingly optimistic yeah. about a lot of things, somewhat boyish. Uh, I, I wear tights, <laughs> just short ones. <laughs> that's used. Uh, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, In yeah. the dating world, that's used as an insult to call them <laughs> Peter Pan. Well, I mean, I'm not dating. Not a couple so sure. Call me that before. <laughs> Layer it on. I don't know what that means, but whatever. So, yeah. I think that would be mine. I think, I don't know. If you have a better one for me, you should let me know in the comments down below. Um, who else knows actually, their Disney I'm actually picture. going through the pictures and I keep landing on Mufasa, which seems a bit egotistical, <laughs> but he's he's very noble yeah, and stone. self-possessed, which I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to go with Mufasa. The, the hair really is where it comes in. You know, I see the connection there. Mane of hair. Certainly. Yeah. 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 Nate, do you, uh, you are, no, you're Donald Duck. Chad. <laughs> I'm always Donald upset. Duck. No, Chad is always upset about stuff. Yeah. I wanted series. to go with McDuck. Morty from Rick and Morty, but it couldn't, uh, it's not, it's not Disney character. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. There are barriers that you have to respect here. Um, Ooh, Amber. Oh yeah. Nate. Oh yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead Nate. Uh, Woody. I kind of look like Woody. I've been oh, yeah. told that. Toy Story. Uh, yeah. 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 You're, you're you're the leader that brings the crew together as well yep. just like just like what he is mm. yeah that's yeah, a good, good one. one all Amber. heart not skill <laughs> <laughs> long limbs lack of coordination <laughs> yep exactly <laughs> freaks out easily <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome yeah uh amber how about you I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm going to go with Maleficent because I feel like I've got a, I've got a dark side to me that, that not everybody sees. Unless you're on Slack, then <laughs> as Nate says, Slack Amber. There were audible gasps right now from our podcast audience. Like I can hear them in the future. Are people like, nice Amber? No, never the evil queen. <clears throat> Huh. Yeah. Mufasa. It, Mufasa has more hair. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe Chad. Yeah, it's it's just the caffeine shampoo. We're just waiting for it. So, this is the sort of rapid fire question we need. We like these ones. Good stuff. Um, fun. okay. Uh, next one from Kent. Uh, this one we actually talked about last week, but Amber and Chad, you were not here to answer this one. And Chad, mm -hmm. you are particularly your your answer is petitioned here. How often do you change your bibs? To clarify for Chad, not how often between washes, but how often do you throw out the old bib and get a new one? If it helps, assume you have a couple in rotation and wear each one twice a week. And he says it's very specific, by the way. <laughs> and he says, yes, watching each one between wear. So Chad, how how often do you like recycle and get a new pair of bibs? <laughs> well, as you might suspect, I, I, I still have, so trainer road has gone through a couple iterations of its branding and I still have clothing from, I think our first clothing run that I ride the trainer on the red, the red bit. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I don't wash Dude. any of this stuff. Just so we're clear. <laughs> oh definitely God. wash it. I definitely wash it, but I get a lot of use out of it. It's, it's probably, I mean, I don't even know that there's a chamois left in it. So, oh whatever. Gosh. It makes me feel like a bike rider. <laughs> that is brutal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Chad's Chad's built different. Um, let's go into Kevin's question. He says, do I need to wear a heart rate monitor to get accurate data for all the new machine learning and the plans? I'm on a smart trainer and have kind of stopped wearing my heart rate monitor. I don't mind breaking out the sensor again if it'll help me get faster. Um, it's not going to no. help your adaptations, yeah, right, Nate? Not currently, but it might in the future. Um, the only time that it will currently do stuff is if you're on an outside ride with a heart rate monitor with no power meter. We will then use that to uh, uh, estimate TSS that could estimate load in the future for like FTP predictions, stuff like that. Next one from Ian. Oatmeal cookies with or without raisins? With. With. Yes. The raisins. I like oatmeal cookies with raisins. Yeah, I know. I We're probably going to be crucified here for this. It seems I that like- so. People she don't like oatmeal. Opinions. Yeah, strangely. They're just like wrong. A, it's okay. It's a pineapple thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I assume that's why he's, he's aiming to cause dissension. Ian is. I think that's mm -hmm. why he's call, asking this. So, Stirring Nate, pot, do you have an Ian. opinion? Either way. Both are good. I like it. <laughs> I like it. It's diplomatic. It's no, uh, yes, right? It just doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. They're, both, Shower, they're literally both good. Shower with or without a washcloth? With. 
Mm, I use a, a exfoliating bar of soap. Kiehl's? Yeah, so effects. Yeah, yeah. stuff's good. Yeah. yeah. Similar. Okay. Kale's uh, something like that. Shower. He also mentions that this second question was a big Chad, debate bath, in a different ba podcast. Bath or shower, Chad? I think Chad's a bath guy. That's what I oh, feel God, like. Oh, God, I'm definitely not a bath guy. No, <laughs> no. I like showers. I like showers and I like quick ones. Wow. So. I just figured Minimal I'll be like shower the other weird thing. That's a very strong response. I just, I just yeah, turn just like the water baths. on, run through it a couple times, and call it good. He just reads the studies in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> Soaks it. With the oh chamois on, does not count as washing. <laughs> That's how he washes the chamois. <laughs> and it's so long and so fast. <laughs> With this classical music playing. <laughs> just uh, his bar legs of soap down there. Recycling. <laughs> <laughs> in his bathtub. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Once again, solid visuals for this podcast. 400 That's watt great. club. <laughs> have Here a, we go. <laughs> a study, an IPA, and a razor. <laughs> With bib straps on. Bib straps yeah. need to be visible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, next week, by the way, stay tuned. Chad's going to do an, uh, a deep dive on some altitude stuff. Is that correct? Next Chad? podcast. Next podcast. Next podcast. Yeah, yeah next on. podcast. Because you will be gone next week, next week correct? Yep. So uh, exciting stuff. Okay. From Andre, we are out of rapid fire now. He says, please give me your thoughts on these crazy Olympic races. Anna Kiesenhofer's solo win. MVDP's strange issue with a disappearing ramp. That's Vanderpool's uh, issue. Pidcock running away with it. Carapaz's, or Carapaz's solo win and Yolanda's absolute dominance. So I, let's just start. Spoiler alert, just so you know. <laughs> we just ruined the whole Olympics. <laughs> you yeah, lost the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Nate. <laughs> I should have, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's been a couple of days for all of those, so I hope it's okay. We didn't even talk about the time trial there, so... Um, Okay, can we start with Kiesenhofer's win? She was the mm -hmm. the the woman that won the women's pro uh, uh, or the women's Olympic road race. Um, that for she, context, uh, sorry, Nate, go ahead. I was gonna say she posts in our forum, like yes. before she won. She posts a whole bunch, so you can in our forum speak to gold medal Olympians. Super duper cool. <laughs> Super cool. Um, so uh, from the gun, she was, or I, I guess yeah, from the gun, she was with the, the first gun, breakaway, yeah. and then the breakaway. The attrition started happening in the break in the breakaway. Then it was four. Then it was three. You know that sort of a thing, and it was just her up there, and she stuck a solo move from the gun in the Olympics and got gold. And she's not a pro cyclist currently, I believe. Is she is she a PhD candidate right now, um, or is post she postdoc? Post so, yep. and she's a mathematician. That's like her. That's her lane that she like owns and loves. Uh, and it's just a really really cool story that like uh, because like the history of the olympics with the amateur athletes too i find it really cool that like you know an amateur athlete is the one that won and i just it's super cool has, i think it's amazing has there been an olympic road race that has won in such a hard that's like the hardest way to win yeah and it wasn't right. a breakaway three people i think it was three and then it went down to like three, it was. and then yeah. she attacked out of the break yeah Oof. it's just like I do, and, I think and also, the commentators mentioned that it happened one other time so maybe it has happened before but that is so impossibly rare and no. so impressive uh, yeah. uh, on her, Gutsy. that effort and the so mental gutsy. fortitude to be like, I'm sticking this against an entire field and against the Dutch team. And <laughs> cause they're like, they're like three absolute hitters. And like, I, I just, it, I was astounded by that. Super impressed. There are a yeah. lot of people that were saying, well, it was because they didn't have radios and because they didn't have radios, the teams got miscommunication and that's the reason she won. And I just think that that is so terrible first of all i think that's ridiculous to say yeah it's part of racing and that the whole peloton knows going in they do not have radios and they still got time checks for motos they still got that information johan brunil uh had mentioned he had, always has a lot of insight on stuff he had mentioned the fact that he thinks that the dutch team perhaps confused the remainder of the breakaway with her going up the road yeah. but this is all part of racing you have to make sure right. you get the information right like well they that's didn't what it too, is they didn't catch the remainder of the breakaway for like until like 4k to go yes. so it's like they were cutting it pretty close i also amber i'm you know way more about women's road racing than any of us do but i in the olympics it's i feel like i don't know if this is true or not but it's less of a team thing like they might say they're a team but like the dutch team all three of those women could have won a gold medal yes <laughs> and i just see like when you work there might be something in your brain too it's just like i'm gonna put out 10 less watts here because I got to save something for the end where I think in professional road cycling, it's very much so. This is the role. This is who we're going for. 
Uh, and it's not just one day over four years. Do you think that played any part of it? I honestly, I'm going to say no. And the reason for that is when you get to that level, there is a, there is a genuine, there's a genuine sense of team that you learn. And that goes really, really deep when you get, when you're racing at the professional level, let's say, let's say on a trade team. Um, a lot of people think, okay, well, you're getting paid to set up a teammate for the win. So that's why you're doing it. And trust me, that does not hurt, but <laughs> it is so much more than that. And when you're at the Olympics, it's, you know, you may have a different Jersey on, um, but you're representing your country and the pride that you would have in getting one of your compatriots on the podium is really, really powerful. And the Dutch women in particular race incredibly well as a team. Um, it can be difficult when you're not used to racing together as a team in that combination. But again, at that level, every single athlete in that race knows how to race as a teammate and is really, really good at that. And also in these races, especially the one day races, and especially a race like the Olympics, it's really, really unpredictable. So racing as a team doesn't always necessarily mean that you're giving up your shot because in that case, um, and if you talk, if you read some of the interviews about how they were playing it out tactically, it wasn't that they were setting it up just for one person. They had a lot of cards to play. It was just about who was going to cover what, when, and how is the race going to tactically unfold? And because they had so many cards to play, it really could have gone to any one of them because they that's are really I mean. heavy hitters. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what, what I mean. Maybe. Yeah. I don't think if they only had I one car and everyone else is working for them. I don't think it incentivizes selfishness in the way that, that you think it might. I really don't. Um, those, Not it's, selfishness is just like, we got to make sure we all don't work too hard because we all could win. Like our chances of winning are higher if we all don't work really hard yeah. rather than just one person and everyone else is going to like pop before the end. It's like, yeah. Saying, but I, I think it's, I think that plays much less of a role than you might think it would. I really do. It dominates yeah. our local uh, week light week night racing. Uh, <laughs> all of us just <laughs> racing like crazy, but yeah, yeah, maybe at that level it's different. It, man, it, what like just I'm super impressed. And a lot of people were saying that like, well, she's a mathematician, so she had calculated this, she had done all that. And while I'm sure that she was running some splits, and she probably can do math a whole lot better in her head than I can when I'm on my bike. Um, but with that said. I think that let's not like just completely remove the racer from this woman. Like mm -hmm. she made a gutsy move and she put it out on the line <clears throat> and she, that was a bold move and a brave move and she made it happen. So it's not like it was just like, Oh, it was calculated. She just had to color by numbers the whole way through. You know, it wasn't, that's not the case, even though she probably was able to do a whole, a hold a cognitive level much higher than us. She still I had the same there. remarks to myself when I was watching the TT because, you know, they're trying to reduce it to math in the case of the women's road race. They were trying to reduce it to physics in the case of the men's time trial. And I'm, and I'm sitting there biting my tongue listening to these commentators <laughs> say it's all physics, it's all physics, it's all physics. Yeah, physics is crucial, but it's not all physics. There's, there's physiology, there's psychology. There are so many other things in physics that are going to de help determine who wins something yeah. like that it's not just who's the most arrow and who has the greatest power there are other things at play let's let's so spoil so let's spoil that yeah, wait wait let's no, spoil I'll talk about the road race can i talk okay, more about yeah, this yeah, go ahead. so i think too her strategy going in as being um the off the gun from the gun attack works really well if you are not marked mm -hmm. like if one of the really big heavy hitters did it the, they wouldn't let them go so that's a perfect strategy you know hey i'm not marked great strategy to do that. And especially too, when everyone else around them, if, if all the people, this is, this goes for if you're in a breakaway too, if you're in a small breakaway and there are many people who think they can win, but they say there's three or four and those are the people to watch. And then you attack from that group. Everyone looks for those people to cover even more so. Each other. Yes. <laughs> even more so if there's like one person like named wow, if you're the one in there and especially if you have a good sprint, they look for that person and then cover. Um, two, her knowing that there's no radios, that's the best time to go for a long breakaway. That, totally. Like, you don't, you don't have the information. And I think that is, I think there shouldn't be radios in pro men's racing. It makes it so much more exciting. And two, the confusion of in being in the Peloton, just in my, you know, local category, USA cycling races, is there three people off the front or two? <laughs> like, and you could probably, <laughs> totally. I don't know if Amber, if you guys got yeah. used to that, of having radios, of not having to count. But when I would race, I would really have to count. And then it gets confusing in 
other races because many people from other races drop back but it can be if if they i don't know if they they had to have known there were there was one woman off the front uh, from um the time check from the motor right but the still it, it seemed like there was some confusion at the end and stuff like that but again just great strategy to be able to do that and even if there wasn't confusion i don't know if they were going to be able to pull her back she had a pretty big lead yeah, yeah i mean first of all she's not a nobody i mean she's she wasn't one of the marked favorites for sure but she's not a nobody she's she's an extremely strong you know athlete who has a track record i mean national champion i think she was what fifth in the european tt maybe i mean mm -hmm. she's very very strong um but to your point nate i think with the radio there's a lot of the question of the radios is interesting to me because when i first started racing professionally we used radios in all of our races and then there was the ban on the radios so I've, I've kind of raced through those two eras if you will um and even when you have a radio what what a lot of people don't understand about the radio is it is slow it is really really slow and you guys know from being in a bike race things happen really fast and you have to make decisions and react in a split second you don't have time to check in with the radio. Sometimes you can get some supplemental information that's a little bit helpful. Maybe you can get more frequent time checks than you would from the moto in the race, but the actual information that you have in the moment you have to make a tactical decision is almost no different. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I think if you're talking about the Tour de France, that's very different. You have the directors in the car, they have a live feed of the race. They can see things in real time, but in most professional bike races, that's not the case. You have a director who's in a car in the caravan, if you're lucky, <laughs> who is relying on you in the Peloton to give them information about what's going on. They also are on race radio, so the officials will be telling them the numbers of the riders in a break and what the, the time gaps are. Um, but again, that's a really slow back and forth and you don't always have time to get that information before you need to make a decision. And so especially at that level, even if you're used to using radios in the world tour, those athletes are really, really good at being aware of what's going on in the, in the race and aware enough that they can make those decisions in a split second. That's not to say things don't get confusing sometimes, but even when you don't have radios, like Jonathan mentioned, you do have the officials on the motos who are, they, what they do is they hold up a whiteboard and they give you time gaps to different groups. Sometimes they'll have the numbers of the athletes in each group. If it's a small group, it depends on, the official in the time. So they may have been relying on that. Who knows what was on the whiteboard? Who knows how gassed everybody was and not thinking clearly. Um, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think that we can say that that is, you know, that is certainly not why Kiesenhofer won. I mean, mm -hmm. she is a phenomenal athlete. She wasn't making any calculations except to say that this is the tactically savvy move for her to make. And any yeah. tactical move is a gamble and you don't mm -hmm. know if it's going to work out, but she stuck it. It's not that she, that that's the reason why she won, but it was a smart move to make, I think because of the circumstances, the course, the yeah. not being the, the favorite and not having radios. It's just like, it's just like a little extra 1%, right? On oh, each yeah. one of those. It's not like a 90% reason why she won. It's just a it little. Defi it defines yeah. calculated risk, right? <clears throat> it's still a risk, but yeah. from beforehand, it's the best risk to take. Like, uh, right. And know, so. the athletes behind her took a calculated risk in letting the break go. Mm -hmm. Another calculated risk, right? I mean, everybody is, is kind of trying to gauge the risk reward benefit of all these decisions and, and making those decisions in a split second on the fly. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy, but these are the best athletes in the world and they, they know what they're doing. So, um, yeah. Yeah. On the TT note, uh, we're going to spoil that one too. Primos was the only <laughs> one I saw against like the top 10, maybe on a chart. He was the only one that negative split. Everybody else had positive splits on that time trial. So to your point, Chad, like, like you can have the greatest aerodynamics and the best, like, you know, power producing capability and all that stuff. But if you blow up and go out too hard, like, I mean, Here's I've never done that, so I wouldn't know. But, um, mm -hmm. if you ever go out too hard, then <laughs> you can really jeopardize the rest of the race. So. Um, can we talk about the ramp thing with Vanderpool? I don't know if anybody saw that in the cross country race. Mm -hmm. Um, but so for world cup and for those that don't know for world cup racing, when they have drops or gaps, they have, uh, they have ramps or bridges in place in training before you race that's commonplace. And then it's understood that then when the race is live, they remove those and they make sure that that's communicated through the communicate that they put out. Uh, that was also communicated in this case and reportedly 
Vanderpool's team or the, uh, the Dutch team manager said it was communicated to Matthew and the rest of the team that that ramp would be moved. And then even Milan Vader, his teammate said, yeah, we were talking about it when we were eating together in the cafeteria or whatever. So, <clears throat> but I think that if you watch, there's a video of Vanderpool coming over the top of that rock. It 100% looks like he is pushing down off that drop, expecting a ramp to be there and it's not yep. there. So I think he just made a mental error of like, maybe he didn't bring, he's, you know, at the Olympics, it's his biggest goal that he's had for years and what's going on. And he, maybe he just blocked that out when people told him, or maybe he forgot about it in the moment. It's easy to make those mistakes, especially when we're seeing cross side from a hard effort. Cause yeah. it really did look like he was expecting it to be there. And it wasn't that said, I think, cause he's extremely skilled on the bike, but I think not having a dropper post really like sealed that fate because if you look yeah. at it when he pressed down hoping that ramp would be there his bike's at a crazy angle and then what happens is the saddle is in your stomach at that point when you're that far back and that saddle then on your stomach becomes like a new hinge point for your body really high center of gravity mm -hmm. and from that point that's where your body hinges so he had if he didn't have a dropper i think with his skills he probably could have pulled it off like it would have looked like the yolanda neff thing when she had exactly. to dodge exactly he, he could have saved it if you were capable of getting lower just like yolanda did she had to react in you know a, a fraction of a second but she did what was necessary what was natural because her saddle was out of the way she could he yeah because and she also poor equipment choice yeah i'll stand by this and i might catch flack for this but i think that she is the most technically sound particularly with body positioning mountain biker in the world male Period. female everything she yeah. is you can't take a bad picture of her on the bike it always looks like the perfect position of where you should be on your bike she's incredible so like you know we're comparing him to her he's incredible as well but she i believe truly is like on another level with her skills so but um and then I just thought it was really cool to see Nino race that race. Like he was going to win. He was going all in for that. And he's a champion and he is like the coolest champion. I can't remember it. You, you tend to dislike dominant athletes when they're, when they dominate for years, right? Like people <laughs> started to not like Michael Jordan when he just continues to win forever. And that, that tends to happen. Um, Chris Froome, Brad Wiggins, Lance Armstrong, um, probably for other reasons, but there with him, it's never that way because he's, while sure it's entertaining to see somebody else win when he was just winning everything for years, he's just a consummate champion. He's a super impressive guy. And he raced that race to win and you could see it. He was putting all his cards on the table. And I thought that that was super respectable for him to go out there and to give it. Cause I think that he knew that it would be real tough for him to win, but he still raced uh, like he could win. And that was really cool to see. So and that course looked so hard. I don't <laughs> know that, that like the technical side, but then the climbs were so steep. They were like, I think Sophia mentioned, maybe Sophia could be getting this wrong. We're going to have her on. She got 23rd, by the way, which is incredible in the Olympics. Like five years ago, she didn't even know that she didn't even, she was like me, the Olympics, no way, you know, like, so to see her do that is just so cool. But I think that she had mentioned that she was dropping to a 30 tooth chain ring, which for her at like five Watts per kilogram, basically that's really low. Like they usually run higher than that, but it's, it was just so steep. That course just <laughs> looked so hard. Um, yeah, super, super, super cool to see. And kudos to Yolanda. Just so cool to see her win. Two more. So do you want to talk about the Pitcock or? Um... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Pitcock. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pitcock. I haven't uh, seen it yet. Okay. So he's <laughs> like, I don't know. He's got to be like the most, the best, the most well-rounded cyclist in the world. I know we say that about Vanderpool, but mm -hmm. Pitcock's really close to Vanderpool. Van and Van Arts. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. It'd be tough, but he's so good. And like, if you look at it, he managed that race. He was not up against the wall the whole time. He got his gap and he managed it. Like he's in, he's incredible. Well, uh, that, that's I, what was so heartbreaking about Vanderpool's F up is, is we had the showdown. <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. it had built for five years between these two fellas. And honestly, outside of Wow Van Art, they're the three, I mean, no one else. Yeah stacks up against them across disciplines and a lot of the times within disciplines they're incredible yeah. riders so to watch vanderpool tank it early on because of a bad equipment choice was heartbreaking because that was going to be an incredible race and in the race for for uh, bronze was what could have been the race for gold if vanderpool hadn't crapped up i agree yeah it, it was a bummer for sure but he's just on tom's like on a different level oh I, yeah he's on I the level of vanderpool and van art 
Yep. He was really smart the way he did it in the race. Um, this is most of us never race at the pointy end of races. So this probably isn't the best advice, but, uh, what he did is he sat in, first of all, he had a bad start position. He worked his way up after the start loop. He was in like seventh. And then he just kind of slowly worked his way, kind of picked guys off and you could tell he was trying to stay within himself. And then at one point, I think Nino was going crazy hard. And then he kind of sat up and he went to the front and he pushed it pretty hard and the, everybody stayed with him, but there were little gaps opening up and then they'd close down over and over. And then they got to the start, the start finish line, the flat area. And Tom basically did a track stand, like forced everybody to come around him. And I think that in that moment that he slowed up, nobody came around him. He really slowed up. They still didn't. And then he basically did the track stand and they came around him. And I think at that point he was like, okay, I've got all of you guys on the ropes. So he sat in. And then as soon as they got to a steep part of the climb, because his power to weight ratio has got to be insane being such a small athlete too. He just absolutely drilled it on the steep part of the climb. So I think that he was gathering information there. Like where are these guys at? I'm feeling really tired, but where are they at? And then he sensed that on the flat section and then just knew he had to hit him where they, it hurts most. So I was super impressed with that, but, um, yeah. And then, uh, Yolanda, it was like peak Yolanda seeing her just doing what she does best without any of like the early going too hard or the crashes or anything else. It's just cool to see. She's incredible. So, yeah. Uh, Carapaz. Yeah. I, um, he mentioned that he didn't have team support for this one, basically like Ecuador was kind of like, you're on your own. Um, he even said that like this medals for me, it's not for Ecuador, which I thought was a very bold statement, wow. but what he was getting at was saying that like the, the nation didn't support him, uh, as they would for other nations. So he was there, he had one teammate, um, but that was, you know, pretty minimal support. And just, I think it's really cool to see that guy win. I know the internet for some reason likes to dislike him, but <clears throat> what an incredible athlete. And Why? He's so pure awesome. class. There's, there's nothing. I, I know. Guy. Right. I don't know. And I think that they disliked that move when he was, uh, suffering and they, and they said poker facing and faking it and then attacking in the tour. It's like, that's what everybody does. <laughs> and that's part of road racing is, is playing things close to the vest and attacking when you need to. So I saw the men's and women's road race, um, and the, the men's, this is, I think was so great. So that, so I forgot who, uh, McNulty attacked, right. Yep. And yeah. then maybe like a second later Carapaz went and there was a group of five or seven, but Wout Van Aert was in that group and Wout has ju had just won the, a sprint finish in the tour de France <laughs> and, uh, what Alpe d'Huez, what Up yeah. Mont Ventoux oh, and a time Ventoux, trial. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> right. So, yeah. uh, if you're Wout, Wout has to know that no one else is going to cover anything of Wout's there, because if you pull Wout to the line, he's going to out sprint you for sure. <laughs> yeah. If like, you pull him up is... to the top of a climb, he's going to outclimb you. If it's like yeah, a long like... break, he's going to out solo you. <laughs> it's like... Exactly. There is Wout has, I feel the responsibility from everyone else there is like, everyone's looking to Wout. And, mm -hmm. and Wout has to go until he drops pretty much. And because he didn't go right then, and he should he should know that Carapaz could go, right? And McNulty, there's uh, everyone in that break was, breakaway was dangerous. Uh, but because that was, it was too big. And he I felt he started pulling maybe like three minutes later, four minutes later, but it was too mm -hmm. long. And I don't, I don't know, I, I felt like he, he would have, he could have, covered it quickly and then everyone else would have came it's just the, it's the problem of being a marked writer is it's, it's worth going back and rewatching because if they played it right then they were banking on him not being ready at that moment so they so they may have timed it such that he had yeah. just done something because yeah. he was the writer to fear not to say there weren't a ton of hitters in that group but he is the guy that's the best mm -hmm. strategy is if you can attack when the person who is the favorite is tired and then there's a little bit of a gap is amber is that what what do you think okay. Yep. yep. Attack when attack when your threat is is either tired or physically blocked. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just about timing. I thought it was, and that's one thing that Carapaz seems to have in spades is his ability to kind of like read that and make moves when they sting the most. He's very good at that. A very savvy racer. So <clears throat> that was cool and really cool to see. I I, I have a soft spot for a soft spot for South America having a sort of mission out there and everything else, and to see. Uh, Latino Americano get a gold medal in the road race is just really, really cool. Um, I think it's awesome. So, and good job McNulty for, uh, yeah. finishing. I think it was sixth, right? Something like that. It's just He's crazy. impressive. I'm, I'm excited for Paris when it comes to that kid. 
Yeah. I can never say um, Tade's last name. Pogacar. 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 Anyways, yeah. him. TP. Uh, two, he <laughs> didn't want to pull Wout up, right? He right. If he pulls Wout up, he's going to get out sprinted. And, yeah. But he probably could have gone with Carapace pretty easily. But then he would have gone. Wout would have covered probably even more try to cover that. It's just, I love the the game um, with game both theory. the men's and the women's race. Yeah, the game theory around it of, yeah. of having, making people look at each other. No, you do it. No, you do it. And that is such a huge part of bike racing. Like, uh, outside of time trials, that's, it's giant for road racing. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, okay. So let's go to looking at the questions that we have left and the time we have left. Let's go to the question number 12, um, for us on our doc guys. Sorry for all the listeners, a uh, little behind the scenes. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, this one says, should the first pullers of a lead out train focus more on slightly longer sprints in 30 seconds to 60 seconds compared to the last guys? I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to kind of talk about building our ideal lead out trains and then kind of talk about how those athletes would have to train differently. So I know that we hear about like Renshaw and Cavendish from back in the day or Michael Morkow and then Cavendish these days, but I, and we hear about these, like, you know, these perfect lead outs with these genetic specimens that are basically perfect at doing 57 seconds and perfect at doing 23 seconds, you know, but most of us don't deal with that sort of like level of genetic predisposition and proficiency. So instead we deal with the folks that are on our club or our friends that we are kind of <laughs> piecing together. <laughs> but once again, like we've talked about plenty of times, we, you don't have to be some genetic world-class sprinter to be a sprinter or to be a lead out person or to be a time trialist, you can choose to be what you want and train. And within a realm of reasonability, you can really achieve a lot of success. So with that said, Amber, this is really about you. Let's talk about building this lead out because since you're a pro road racer, um, let's talk about building this like lead out team, but then let's also talk about like how you would train them, how the athletes should train depending on their position in that lead out train. Well, first of all, a 30 second sprint is a really, really, really long sprint. I wouldn't almost even <laughs> call that a sprint. So a 30 second max effort is not quite a sprint. A sprint is more, you're talking about five, 10, maybe 20 seconds. 20 seconds is a long sprint. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we're talking about a true sprint, massive maximal effort, uh, it's quite short. So when you're thinking, if, if we were to just theoretically identify a long flat stretch of road with no obstacles, no gradient, <laughs> no corners, and we were just going to do a lead out, then in theory, what you want is a long enough train to take control somewhere between 2k and 1k out. And then enough. Which, riders... How long is that in terms of like a race, Amber, 2k to 1k? That's that could be pretty long in this case, like a flat race. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it, it all depends, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do the math in my head at the moment, but sure. in, a, in, in real life, I mean, what, where you start the, the lead out depends a lot on the course and what's happening in the race, right? The goal with initiating the lead out is to take control of the front. And once you take control of the front, that's it. You are committed. Now your now your job is to control the line, keep anybody from coming around you, which means that you have to go fast enough to discourage or make impossible any attacks um, and make it so hard for anybody to come up even next to you, let alone around you, that people either can't or won't. Um, and in real life, that is an art form because you don't want to do more than is necessary necessary to maintain control of the front. And sometimes in real life, not in our theory, theoretical world, but in real life, <laughs> um, <laughs> The rest of the peloton is usually happy if, if there is a team that is willing to go to the front and take control the rest of the peloton is is usually happy to let them do that unless there's another really strong team that also wants control uh, but in our in our idealized world you'll take over the front at some point in those last couple of kilometer kilometers the the first person to take a pull on the lead out their pull will be longer than the last person to take a pull before the sprint um, but it's not necessarily going to be 60 seconds would be really, really long. I would think more in terms, I would think less in terms of time and more in terms of distance. So it's more like you wouldn't, you wouldn't want anybody pulling more than 500 meters. If, if you 
had a choice more like 300 meters is better. And then when you're getting down to the last one or two people before your sprinter, it's going short because those, those two people are really getting down to, from what might be more of a kilo effort, um, to more of a sprint effort. So from a 30 second effort down to a 20, 10, 15 second effort. I see Chad nodding. Chad, you want to jump in on this one too? Oh, no, not at all. I'm just agreeing. Okay, <laughs> good. Mm -hmm. I'm on track. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so in theory, as, as you peel off one rider after another off the front, each pull should be shorter and faster. So the whole train should be accelerating leading into that final sprint. Now, ideal and theoretical never happens in real life. So what actually usually happens is you have a rider at the front who is strong enough to pull the entire train to the front, take over the front and establish control. That rider needs to be the kind of rider who can read the race, who's resilient. They may end up having to pull. I mean, I, I was often in that position and there were times when I would get to the front, people were happy to let us take over and I could do a, a standard 500 meter pull and be done. Other times things got hairy and I had to continue a pull for two or three laps because <laughs> we had lost somebody. And, and so you have to be willing to read the situation and adjust what's going on on the fly. Um, so there's not really a, a a good formula to say, if you're the first lead out person, here's what you do and here's how you train. Um, that said, you do need to be able to train your anaerobic system really, really well because you need to be able to throttle it <laughs> and really throttle it in a way that is going to discourage the heck out of everybody around you from wanting to come around you. The earlier a uh, person in a lead out. So the, one of the per people to take over the lead out train early on, um, that person also needs to be easy to follow through a group. As you get back toward the final sprinter, those folks are going to have, may need to navigate some tighter, twistier maneuvers through the field. But that first person you're leading a whole team, maybe of five, six, 10 athletes, depending on how many people are on your team. And you have to be thinking about, is this a line, not only that the person behind me can take, but that three people behind me can take, is this going to be a line that my sprinter can follow? Um, and the way that you're communicating through that lead out is from the back to the front. So the, the sprinter is talking to the person in front of them is talking to the person in front of them is talking to the person in front of them. So the person on the front is getting information from the rider behind them, but also at the same time having to, so they're taking information of what they can see in front of them, but also they're listening to their teammates to understand what's happening behind them. So if, if there's a surge coming and they can't see it cause it's not in their peripheral vision yet, the person behind them will let them know they can throttle it up again. So that first person, it's not a 30 second or 60 second flat out sprint. It's really ramping it up just enough to take control and being ready at any moment to have to absolutely throttle it to avoid getting swarmed or to get your team into a different position. And then as you go back through the line, it's really just about shortening those pulls and getting the speed up. Sometimes even that last lead out person right before dropping off the sprinter, something might happen and they may end up having to take a 500 meter pull, excuse me, instead of a 200 meter pull. And their, their only goal is to drop the sprinter off in the ideal position. And they just need to make that happen period, yeah. no matter what's going on around them. And that can get really hairy as, as we definitely saw during the tour this year. There's also, I think a myth, right? Amber that exists where you just think that like, oh, well, since this person has been waiting in the draft waiting, I'm saying in air quotes, <laughs> you know, that last person, they just really have to focus on that one hard effort, but they've been really, they've been working extremely hard just to stay mm -hmm. on that train. So it's like, yeah, you know, an effective lead out train, everybody should feel like they're all working hard or else the field is going to come around you. <laughs> so yes. if you're, if you're not working hard, um, Chad, do you have uh, any thoughts on this as far as like training an ideal lead out train? I know that you were more, uh, you did a whole lot of racing in this sort of environment with sprint trains and such back in the day. Uh, <clears throat> nothing really to pile onto what Amber's already said. I do have particular recollections where, it, a lot of the motivation came from the rider who was behind me. Mm -hmm. So I basically, each rider in the line, whether it's three riders, five, six, whatever, one, 
is, is relying on it. Not only the information from the writer behind you, but the motivation, because I think of one writer in particular who was trying to drive home how fast I need to go, how hard I need to work to be that particular person in the lead out. And all he ever said was faster. Never said, <laughs> I mean, just said faster over and over and over. And every time I thought I can't possibly go faster, he would yell with conviction faster and I'd find a way and I'd go a little mm -hmm. faster until, you know, I basically blew myself up and then it's out of my hands. I swing off and, and the next writer comes through, but uh, it, it just kind of woke me up to the fact that hard enough never exists. You're never going <laughs> as fast as you can when it comes to a lead out. And, and, and you'll know this because you'll either get swarmed or you'll, you'll blow up. But in any case, the, the decision will handle itself. What, what do question. you think about this, Nate? Yeah. I have a question for Amber. For the second to last, so the last lead out person, and they're dropping their sprinter off at, would you say 300 meters maybe? Oh, no. 200, 200, 200 meters. meters. Okay. Maybe even 100 um, meters ago. Are they sprinting at the very end of their pull? Are they, trying, are they out of the saddle sprinting as hard as they can? to get maximum speed for themselves at that drop-off point? Usually, yes. But there are a variety of scenarios in which that may not be true. If it's a downhill sprint, they might want to do a seated sprint. Um, that is where you will have a, a high degree of communication with your sprinter. So if I'm dropping off our team sprinter and I'm the last lead out person, my sprinter needs to know if I'm going to jump out of the sandal saddle standing, <laughs> or if I'm going to start mm -hmm. seated and get up, or if I'm going to stay seated. Um, and at that point, basically what you do is the drop off point for your sprinter is your finish line. So you get there as if you were trying to win the race by getting to that line. And then it's up to your sprinter to decide when and where they come around you. So I'm not going to swing off. If I'm the last lead out person, I am just going to go as if I were trying to do a race winning sprint, but my finish line is at 200 to go or 150 to go instead of at the actual finish line. And then the sprinter is in my draft and they're probably going to drop off and do the little slingshot, you know, the sprinters gap move off from my acceleration. But if the faster I'm moving, if they're accelerating in my draft, the faster they're able to accelerate and the faster they are, the, the quicker they're able to hit a, a top speed when they finally do come out of my draft and come around me. Um, so yeah, it, it's really, it's a, it's whether you're seated or standing is a question of terrain and course, but it's really your job is to pretend your finish line is wherever you're dropping off your sprinter and you just, everything you've got emptying the tank. I would like to lead John out at an air center crit. Yes. That'd be quite yeah. cool for a video. It's so It'd be really yeah. fun. I like the uh, power box or something or closer. Uh, what do you mean power box? There's like a box that we used to sprint oh. from with Pete. Yeah. Yeah. I would that need good? something Is that too far out. That's no, that would be, that would be even a little close for me. I think I'm better with a longer sprint. I can snap, but then I can hold really well. But if you're talking about like a short sprint, my snap is still not substantial enough against others, but I'm pretty see, sure no like... one's getting around me. <laughs> Just, you know. <laughs> but really though if i go I like from like yeah if it's like a 45 second no one in the air center because there's not real teams are probably going to come around at 45 seconds like the back side of that thing yeah nate uh, so this is a good example like nate has a really clear indication of what he's best at in terms of like durations and efforts and Nate's really good for those durations somewhere around a minute like very very good i can't come those around are so it. painful it's 53 yeah. seconds yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, and it, if you can stay in the draft, then man, you're going to be at a really high speed for quite a slingshot, particularly on a course like that, where you can just pedal through everything, you know, um, not that last like corner. Whew, I've clipped a pedal there. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. if you're going, that's another thing though, like, like, um, on sometimes a whole race, you'll be okay. But if you're going at 34, you mm -hmm. just bank a little more and you can't pedal through that corner. So know yeah. that corners are, they, uh, you, you, you're leaning over more as you're going faster and you can't pedal through it. So don't, don't, it's not yeah. safe to assume you can make it. If you made it the or whole you race, adjust you can your make line. it the end. You adjust your line because that speed and instead of having, cause that turn likes to you can naturally force right you. Yeah, yeah. It likes to naturally force you to make a tighter, uh, apex there coming out. And you also feel like you sure. don't want to go wide in the middle of a turn because you're like, oh, somebody might go underneath you. But if a corner naturally tightens at the end, 
you can, in many cases, still people can try to dive the inside, but as long as you have momentum and you have relative position on them, you can close them off and they really have to slow down. So it's really, instead of about going wide in the end, it's about letting yourself drift a little wider in the middle there. And then you don't have to tighten it up quite as much. It's, um, it's a good thing. I know that's very specific to a turn. One thing that I wanted to mention with this is that it's not like one person just works on their 15 second sprint. One person works on their 10 and another works on their five. It's about working on aerobic capabilities and anaerobic capabilities as they relate to sprinting. So it's really about working on a person's ability to be able to put out high amounts of power at, through over like, uh, that four minute duration, that three minute duration, two minute, whatever it is. Cause that's really pulling on the strings that you need. You'll see a lot of intervals that we have where it starts hard and then it drops you down, like in the crit plan to where you're still above threshold, but you started way above threshold. Then you sit at VO two or even the opposite where you start out of VO two and then you finish strong, have one in the middle of it and you continue. Um, that's why following a structure plan is super important. And that's why like, it would be foolish of a person even like, like Cavendish to just train his, just train his sprint. And that's it. He doesn't do that. He trains a whole lot of stuff to be able to hold on to that lead out train for as long as he needs to and do everything he needs to before that lead out train for the whole race. So, right. You might, it usually ends up feeling like a series of sprints, right? Because mm. you are coming out of a corner, you're having to decelerate into corner. You're having to accelerate around somebody who's blowing up. There's it's, it's very rare that you have clean air all the way through a lead out. It's just not going to mm -hmm. happen. So it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Nate. I, to, no, go ahead. I, I interrupted you. Nope. Go for it. I'm, I'm done. Okay. Two things. First Cavendish said before, like everyone thinks sprinting is just like top power, but he said it was like, you got to hold 500 Watts for three minutes and then sprint. And that's mm -hmm. very different than just getting on the road and sprinting. Uh, yeah. And then two, sorry. Meanwhile, all of us average Joe's are like, well, and Jane's were like, well, I hit 1200 Watts. My peak power is this. It's like, who cares about your peak power? Right. Like Cav was saying there is like, what matters is what you can do in non-ideal circumstances. Yeah. When you're gassed, what, how, how can you sprint? Yeah. And Amber, when, um, people are peeling off for like, how do you decide, how do you communicate, do you communicate or does the person in the back just decide when they should then take over? Like, especially for the last person, are they flip their elbow when they're like about to give up? Or is it just a, I guess the last person might be a position on the road, but before that, what is their communication or do you just feel like they're slowing down? So you go. Yeah. Um, it depends. <laughs> this is our answer for everything. It depends. <laughs> usually what'll happen, uh, especially in a crit, uh, or a race where you've been able to preview the finish as a team, as a team, you'll identify landmarks where, okay, I'm going to take over with so many laps to go. So-and-so is going to take over at this point. And then when you get down within that last 500 meters or kilometer, then it's okay. I'm taking you through this corner and then this person is going. So using course characteristics is a really good way of doing that because that can make it easier. But again, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face, right? So <laughs> you might have a great plan and then realize that you have to change it on the fly. And in that case, what usually ends up happening is let's say I was supposed to pull to that corner, but I can tell I'm going to blow up before then I'll give an elbow and yell off so that I, I don't get in the way. And the person behind me knows, okay, I got to take over sooner than I thought. Or if the person behind, if I think I feel fine and the person behind me can tell I'm slowing down cause you mm -hmm. can feel it that the person behind me can actually feel it better than I can. They'll just yell, they'll yell off to me which is instruction for me to get off and then they'll come around me. Um, so it really depends on what's happening and it could go either way. The communication can go either way, but usually it's the writer who's behind the second writer in line, who's going to make the call of, okay, you were supposed to go to that corner, but you're slowing down and I can feel it and we need to keep the speed up. So get out of the way <laughs> I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm coming through. And then that person then has to, make that resilient choice of, okay, my, my pool's going to be longer than I thought it was. Um, and so on down the line. So yeah, it just yeah. got to make the call in the moment. The other thing I had, I've seen Mike's bikes do to me is when they switch people in the lead out train, they actually like it accelerates and that little <laughs> jump that causes like breaks in, it makes it harder for everyone else. Is that, do you, do you try to do the acceleration or is that just an over ego person? Uh, when you switch it's, off in the lead out train, 
versus keeping just... like a stable pace you're saying Nate? yeah exactly like a slow ratchet up where it just keeps mm -hmm. getting faster and faster it's like one person pulls off and it's like boom and i'm like oh my goodness i just did a mini sprint to try to keep up with it and then there's gaps behind that that happen and they have to close and oh, probably a little bit over ear so again ideal scenario the overall speed of the entire train will increase toward the sprint but increase gradually without surges because um, the surge will hurt everybody behind that person too in the lead out train so you don't really want to do that but when you're talking about trade-offs you're better off keeping the speed high and keeping people from attacking you um, and if that means that you surge a little bit when you pull, pull through the 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 cost of the surge to the people in your team's lead out is lower than the cost would be if someone were to attack you so you're mm -hmm. better off surging a little bit and keeping the speed high um and and again perfect is theoretical it's almost never going to happen i don't think the surge is on purpose to hurt the rest of the field because again it is hurting the people behind them but it's a cost benefit analysis right they're better off keeping the speed high and mm -hmm. accidentally surging than pulling through too slowly dropping the speed and having to bring it back up again maybe they should have pulled through earlier the riders behind them in that case right amber like Probably. before that speed had a chance to drop <clears throat> if that was the case if it was high and dropping um mm -hmm. that's a mistake that i've made uh pete tried to leave me out at air center once uh and I, we have this in our race analysis you can go onto our youtube channel that's just youtube.com trainer road and you can see we have playlists of race analysis that you can watch and pete was leading me out and it was great and he slowed down and just me being in you know race brain mode i should have came around him as soon as his momentum started to slow and instead I hesitated for a second and then, and boy, isn't that the story with me? I've done that plenty of times. So but other people went, right? So they, they yep, were on your they wheel. Went. They felt the slow down and they went, they went and then you were, yep. you and pretty much I, led or your two person lead out for them. <laughs> exactly. I was fighting for peanuts after that. So, um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it's interesting because I think that we have this idealized version of what a sprint looks like, but very rarely is it ever that at the pro level, let alone at the amateur level. So, um, it's I just wish. Yes. I just wish Chad really was still messy. racing. I want to be in a lead out train with Chad. He's such a stable wheel and such like a savvy captain. It'd be fun. So those are, those are my dreams, Chad. Don't crush my dreams. Come back and race. So, um, thanks everybody for joining us. This has been an, uh, an awesome episode. Uh, and I appreciate Amber. I appreciate you so much. Uh, you have a lot on your plate thanks. and you still do such a fantastic job for the podcast. We're excited for you to become a mother. It's wonderful. And Jonathan. Thank we're you. not sure the exact day Amber is going to come back because yeah. things happen. And well, what day do you think you're going to come back? And we won't hold you to it. So everyone will not ask uh, John and I <laughs> in, on Instagram over and over They'll again. They'll still ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and then I'm, if we don't say anything for a while, they'd be like, why are you stopping Amber from coming on the podcast? <laughs> yeah. What did she do? You What's prevent? your agenda? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <yeah. laughs> I'm planning for three months after the birth. So I don't know exactly when the birth is going to be, but you know, so over three months from now and we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's a lot, a lot of uncertainty in this timeline. <laughs> but, it's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Take the time you need for sure. So, uh, if, uh, all of you, you should go on to Instagram and go follow Amber Malika. You can see her link on here you can find it down below and wish her, wish her all the, the well wishes that you can, uh, it'd be great. So it's exciting Thanks, time. Everyone. And follow Trainer Road. Uh, we, uh, Maxine, our amazing podcast producer, Piper, one of our fantastic video editors. They're always putting out awesome content and same with our copywriters. And if you follow Trainer Road, if you subscribe to our blog list and you follow us on social, you're going to be surrounded by content that makes you faster. And that's <laughs> the perfect complement to the training you're already doing. So that's why we do all this is to make you faster. So go do that, subscribe on the blog, follow us on all the different social channels that you use. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.